aquí. Good morning um, and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. I uh, was to ask everyone at this point um, uh, to switch off mobile, f mobile phones as, they, as we know they can often interfere with the sound system. Although um, I should point out, uh, as I normally do, that uh, members uh, in class will be using um, tablet de devices instead of hard copies of papers. The first uh, item on the agenda today uh, is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, and I invite the committee to agree to take item three on today's uh, agenda in private. Uh, can I have the agreement of the committee? Thank you very much for that. Um, we now uh, move to our agenda item uh, number two, stage two of consideration of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Uh, and members should have a, a copy of the groupings and the marshal list. Um, I, I uh, should, for the, the record, remind members that uh, the ministers and officials are here and are strictly supportive. Uh, ministers and officials are here in a strictly supportive capacity this morning. They can't speak during proceedings or indeed by, be questioned by the members. Everyone should have a copy of the bill as introduced, uh, the first master list of the amendments and the first grouping of the amendments. I'm assuming everyone has them. There will be uh, one debate on each grouping of amendments. I will call the member who, is, uh, who, who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to, uh, to and move that amendment and speak to all other amendments in the group. I will then call on the other members who have amendments in the group. Finally, the member who lodged the first amendment in that group will be asked to wind up uh, the debate and press or withdraw their amendment. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should catch my attention and, and make that a request in the usual way. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, I must check whether any member objects uh, to it being withdrawn. If any member objects to the committee, um, uh, committee the, the committee immediately moves to the vote on the amendment. If any other member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Any other MSP can move move it, of course, but it will not specifically. Uh, I will not specifically invite other members to do so. If no one moves it, I will call the next amendment. So I move now to uh, the, the 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 to call amendment one in the name of Bob Doris, grouped with amendments 2, 3, 66, 4 and 64. I, I should point out uh, that if amendment 3 is agreed to, I cannot call amendment 66, which is preempted. Okay. Um, Bob Doris, to move amendment 1, to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank uh, you, Bob. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning. In, in moving Amendment 1 and speaking to all amendments in the group, can I, can I thank the government for the dialogue they've had with me in the preparation of these amendments, uh, in particular to Amendments 1 and 2. The Tribunal in particular raised concerns to the committee that the changes for removing a period of time from the end of a compulsory treatment order through Section 1, 2 and 3 could be unclear. They noted that this provision could also be inequitable as it did not take into account the extension certificate. In our committee stage one report, uh, we asked the Scottish Government to respond to concerns raised and to provide further clarification how it would operate in conjunction with certain detention orders. Therefore, the amendments that I have now prepared and I'm moving today will have the effect of removing any period of detention between the expiry of the original uh, short-term detention certificate and the first tribunal hearing from the end of the CTO or interim CTO. These amendments uh, will hopefully meet the concerns of fellow committee members that we had in our stage one report. Now moving to amendment three. This removes the provision in the bill that would have extended the, the period of short term detention possible under section 62, 68.2a from five days to ten days to allow the tribunal to arrange the first hearing in relation to a CTO application and the consequent amendments to section 39 of the 2003 Act. This means that the existing arrangements in the 2003 Act are retained which limits the period authorised to five days. 
Um, I, I think just in, 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 in closing, convener, uh, I will just say that um, I think uh, we were all keen initially to see moving from five to ten days in relation to this, but the evidence that was presented to the committee was that uh, the problem that that was seeking to solve seems to have assuaged somewhat uh, in recent years, and that's the reason for Amendment 3 to go back, if you like, to the status quo position. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Dr Richard Simpson to speak to Amendment 66 and other amendments in the group. I begin by welcoming the amendments moved in the name of Bob Doris, numbers 1, 2 and 3, uh, because this does mean that if passed, as you have indicated, convener, my amendment will, will, will fall. But the, the justification for the proposed extension in the bill as tabled uh, for a tribunal hearing from five to ten days was that it was in the patient's interest to ensure a reduction in repeat tribunals. Uh, there was a firm denial that the rationale behind this proposal was for administrative convenience, but it was to focus on the patient, uh, the patient protecting the patient. However, as Mr. Doris has already indicated, many witnesses uh, suggested that an extension might become the norm rather than the exception. Furthermore, providing the increased flexibility would lead to a lowering of pressure to reduce the number of repeat hearings, which was, it was acknowledged had already been significant under the current tribunal chair. Karen Kirk of Legal Services Agency suggested, however, that a further reduction of hearings may not be an entirely appropriate ambition and also raised concerns that the provision as drafted might not be compliant with Article 5, the right to liberty and security in the European Convention on Human Rights. And this view was partly supported by the Human Rights, Scottish Human Rights Commission witness. Despite the reservations that were expressed, I, I basically, and I think the rest of the committee, did export, uh, support the extension from five to ten days. What my amendments would do, if Amendment 3 is not passed, would ensure that this, this only occurs in specific circumstances. So in, in essence, uh, it is, what I'm proposing is that the extension should only be granted either on an application by the patient or the patient's representative, uh, because they wish to have further time, or where the application was made by the health professionals, it should only be with the consent of the patient or the patient's representative. Um, this would leave the extension to 10 days occurring in, in circumstances uh, where the patient or the patient's representative consented or an, uh, an additional condition would be where it was an exceptional condition where the tribunal itself had stated clearly the reasons for the extension. I would expect that either in regulations or guidance those exceptional circumstances would be more clearly spelt out if not fully divine, defined. Um, I believe that this set of amendments were brought, are, are more broadly in line with the committee's report and will allow the flexibility. I am not clear, and I will ask the, uh, Mr. Doris in summing up, and perhaps the minister uh, when he's addressing these amendments, whether the tribunal are now happy for the, uh, the extension to 10 days to be completely removed. Uh, if this is the case, clearly my amendment will not be necessary. Thank you, Richard. Can I uh, welcome the Minister formally to, to, to the committee and ask the minister to, minister to speak to Amendment 4 and other amendments in the group? Thank you, uh, Convener. Can I thank uh, Bob Doris and Dr Simpson for introducing the amendments on uh, this issue in relation to the issue of the extension of a short-term detention certificate and the Scottish Government's response to the committee's Stage 1 report. I recognised uh, the concerns about the extension applying in all cases and on the other side of the argument, the views of the Mental Health Tribunal that there could be benefits from allowing service users more time uh, to prepare the response committed to exploring whether an amendment could be made, which would mean the extension does not apply automatically in all cases. We explored several uh, solutions, two included giving the patient and their representatives the option to request longer, either as part of the interview with a mental health officer when uh, an application for a compulsory treatment order is being considered, or after the application had been made. The latter option seems to be most similar to what has been proposed by uh, Dr Simpson. Uh, another was to have a procedural or paper hearing of the tribunal look at whether it would be appropriate for there to be an additional five days before uh, the hearing. However, uh, I understand this may uh, take account of some of Dr Simpson's uh, remarks about the views of the tribunal. I understand that the tribunal has expressed some reservations with uh, pursuing any of these uh, approaches and balance it do not seem to as a, a practical solution to ask an unwell patient who may not yet have seen the application full or appointed legal representation to make a decision as to whether they would like to be detained for a longer period when they may be distressed by detention in the first place. Uh, allowing a hearing to be arranged and then postponed and request at short notice as it becomes clear the patient is not ready 
it is likely to be expensive and cause last minute issues for all involved, including panel members, responsible medical officers and mental health officers, let alone uh, the patient and uh, the named uh, person. I understand the tribunal also gave views in relation to whether it can make a judgment as to whether more time is required. Our view reflecting on this is that it would not be fair to expect the tribunal to make such a judgment without significant inf information from the patient, but it would also be an unfair additional request of an unwell uh, patient. Overall, uh, having taken views uh, expressed by the tribunal into account, our concerns is that amendments to this effect, including uh, those uh, proposed by Dr Simpson, it could be adding a cumbersome process to what is a quite a tight time period to ensure that a patient has a hearing. A proper. So I would thank Dr Simpson for applying some thought to seeking a resolution to this issue, but I would ask that members support Amendment 3 in preference to Amendment 66. In relation to Amendments 1 and 2 on reducing the overall period of detention, I agree that this will result in a fairer and more equitable system and ask members to support the amendments. And I gave a commitment at my appearance at stage one to propose uh, amendments uh, along the lines of amendments four and 64. The amendments relate to the new duties brought in uh, by the bill where a mental health officer must provide a report to the tribunal in relation to the determination to extend a compulsory treatment order or compulsion order. The amendments mean that the report will only be required where there has been a change in diagnosis, uh, the mental health officer disagrees with the determination or where the mental health officer has failed to comply with their duty to express a view. It removes the requirement to provide a report to, to, to the tribunal for all two year reviews of compulsory treatment orders and compulsion orders. I would ask members to support these amendments. Minister, um, Bob Doris to wind up press and withdraw. I, I haven't had an indication of any other member. Bob Doris, uh, to press or withdraw. Uh, th thank you, thank you, convener. Um, just in, 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 in winding up, can I just reflect on uh, Dr Simpson's comments and, and thank him for elaborating further in, in the reason why Amendment 3 has been placed in relation to the reduction in multiple hearings uh, over the year since the initial recommendation was made to allow the extension from five to ten days, which indeed is the driving force behind uh, Amendment 3, which I have placed today. I note that uh, Dr Simpson's amendment uh, it could, in theory, provide, uh, if you like, a, an alternative uh, solution to that, but uh, I'm tempted to agree with the Minister that that could provide additional necessary complexity, uh, bureaucracy, and put burdens on, on, on patients also, which is why I, I am keen to see Amendment 3 passed as opposed to the alternative by by Dr Simpson. And uh, finally, in relation to Amendments 1 and 2, indeed there could have been other uh, solutions to to, 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 to having the, the, the policy in practical effect that Amendments 1 and 2 achieve. But in drafting these amendments, again, I've been minded to uh, keep it as simple, straightforward, unbureaucratic and as uncomplex as possible so that it can be used effectively in, in practice if passed here today. And uh, I press Amendment 1. Convener. The question is then that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're all agreed. Thank you. Uh, we now move to call Amendment Two in the name of Bob Do Doris, already debated with Amendment 1. Uh, Bob Doris, to move or not move? Uh, moved, convener. Um, the question, therefore, is that uh, Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 3 in the name of Bob Do Doris, already debated with Amendment 1. Bob Doris, to move or not move? Eh, moved. Um, remind members at this point that Amendment 3 is, car is agreed to. I cannot call amend Amendment uh, 66. Question is then, Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, we are all agreed. Thank you. Um, the question then is that, question, uh, that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I now call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, do you move formally? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Uh, can I now call uh, 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 Amendment 93 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 22, 23, 96... 112, 61, 62 and 63. Uh, can I can ask the Minister to move Amendment 93 and speak to all amendments in the group. It can be the main policy driver for this group of amendments is to clarify the position that a patient could be detained in a specific unit of a hospital rather than a hospital at large. These amendments will make it clear 
that detention orders made in both a civil and criminal context may set out a specific hospital unit in which the patient is to be detained, and this supports the movement of patients within hospitals as well as between them. Uh, related to this is the need to address the fact that there is currently no procedure for transferring patients subject to interim compulsory treatment orders in response to concerns expressed by the Mental Welfare Commission. It is a complex group of amendments and it is going to take me some time to, to go through them, so I hope you will bear with me. Uh, convener, on the civil side, it is Amendment 22 that means that references in sections 36, 44 and 62 to 68 of the 2003 Act to a hospital may be read as references to a hospital unit. It will allow for emergency detention orders, short-term detention orders, interim compulsory treatment orders and compulsory treatment orders to authorise detention in a specified hospital unit. And a mental health officer's proposed care plan may propose that a patient is detained in a specified hospital unit. The amendment will also enable the removal of patients subject to emergency or short-term detention certificates to a particular hospital unit or to a different unit within the same hospital. On the criminal side, Amendment 112 proposes to introduce a new section to Part 6 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 on the specification of hospital units. Part 6 of the, that Act makes provision dealing with mentally disordered people within the criminal justice system in Scotland. The purpose of the amendment is firstly to provide that any reference to hospital in that part of the Act may be read as a reference to hospital unit where a hospital unit means any part of a hospital which is treated as a separate unit. Uh, this means that any order or direction which may already be made under Part 6 of the Act authorising the detention of a person or patient in a specified hospital may be made authorising detention in a specified hospital unit. This relates to assessment orders and treatment orders relating to remand patients as well as the following orders relating to mentally disordered offenders, interim compulsion orders, temporary compulsion orders, compulsion orders, uh, compulsion orders and restriction orders, hostel directions and transfer tr for treatment directions. Uh, this goes further than the effect that would have been achieved by sections 36 to 38 of the bill, which are consequently to be removed by amendments 61, 62 and 63. Sections 36 to 38 relate only to compulsion orders made with a restriction order, hospital directions and transfer for treatment directions. Amendment 23 amends section 136 of the 2003 Act, which provides for the Scottish ministers to authorise the transfer of prisoners to hospital for treatment for mental disorder. It will allow references to hospital to be read as references to a hospital unit and to provide the definition of hospital unit as meaning any part of a hospital which is treated as a separate unit. Amendment 112 also makes provision as how section 61A of the Act, inserted by section 35 of the Bill, is to apply and release the transfer from one hospital unit to another within the same hospital. In terms of the secondary driver, I refer to Amendment 93, Amendment Section 124 of the 2003 Act to include reference to interim compulsory treatment orders. Interim compulsory treatment orders are orders authorising the detention of a patient in hospital made under Section 65.2 of the 2003 Act. This will enable the transfer between hostels of patients subject to interim compulsory treatment orders as well as patients sub subject to compulsory treatment orders. Uh, this provides a formal process to authorise a transfer from one hospital to another for a patient detained under an interim compulsory treatment order. Amendment 96 proposes to insert a new section 124A into the bill to make new provision in the 2003 Act about transfers between hostel units. Section 124A would apply to patients subject to compulsory treatment orders and interim compulsory treatment orders where the order specifies the particular hostel unit in which the patient is to be detained. The new section 124A would enable enable the managers of the hospital in which the patient is detained to transfer the patient to another unit within the same hospital or hospital unit. The effect of both the amendments 93 and 96 will be the interim compulsory treatment order patients will also be able to be transferred from one hospital unit to another where the interim compulsory treatment order authorised detention in a specified hospital. And I move amendment 93, convener. Thank you, Minister. Um, any me members I see Richard Simpson? Yes, Just uh, one question for the Minister when he's summing up, and that is, one of the concerns that's been expressed to me is the fact that we do not have uh, accommodation now in the state hospital for female prisoners, and uh, sorry, for those charged. Um, and I'm just wondering whether this, these amendments as they stand or the later amendments on cross-border uh, uh, issues will allow the minister to transfer individuals south of the border, um, you know, just, just to get that, that straight, because at the, at the moment, I'm not quite sure whether where people, uh, f female individuals who are charged and have an interim order placed against them uh, um, because of criminal acts, um, where they're going to be de detained. Are they going to be detained in a medium secure unit? Are they going to be detained in a unit in England? Because we have no, sec we have no top secure units for female prisoners any longer. Any other members? 
and no, no other members. Minister, um, to, to wind up. OK, well, just picking up on the point that's been made by Richard Simpson, I think probably it will would, it will come back in greater detail in writing to Richard Simpson at that point, but my instinct is that I think both would probably be yeah, likely that the court could direct to either medium security or it could be uh, to uh, a place forth of, of Scotland. Um, so it could be the case that the amendments that come down uh, the line later, which we'll debate later, will be uh, uh, relevant here. Um, but I would observe that I think there is a great merit in these particular amendments. It seems uh, somewhat onerous that uh, at present uh, you can't go through the process of referring from one part of the hospital to the other. So I think there is great merit in these amendments and I hope they will be supported by the committee. The question is then that Amendment 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I now call Amendment 67 in the name of uh, Dr Richard Simpson, Group with Amendments 68 and 69. Dr uh, uh, Simpson to move Amendment 67 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Partly from the fact that I felt that the, the original bill as presented was to a very great extent, a diminution of patient rights. Um, and it was a, a fairly administrative or provider bill. And of course, much of the, many of the changes that are being moved today by the, by the government indeed, do actually roll back on some of the reductions in patient rights, which did concern me. But this is a particular one where the language really uh, was something that I felt um, rather worried about. And I um, want to have the government's reply on, on record. Um, when I decide to whether to press the amendment or not. My, f my amendment basically relates to the section in line 20 of section 3 of the bill, 3A, where it says the managers of the hospital may, so far as they consider it appropriate, give notice of matters notified to them under section 37 of this Act to the persons mentioned in subsection 4 below. I, I just think that when managers are have a may instruction that simply allows them to make it and when it's further caveated by saying they can decide if it's appropriate or not uh, it, it really worries me so this this amendment is say, changing it to must and saying unless it's impractical to do so uh, it does allow a get out for the managers uh, if it's not possible uh, for them to, to notify people but I think that they, they actually should notify people of, of things that are going on the other amendment is to simply include advocates in, in the, those who are notified of, of these matters. Uh, so that 68 is, is dealing with that and 69 is merely a consequential amendment. So I look forward to hearing the government's response to that. No other members. Minister? Thank you. Convener, let, let me uh, address amendment 67 and can I say to Dr. Ma Dr. Simpson, I understand his rationale, but I hope to be able to reassure him the rationale for allowing hospital managers to only share information where they consider it appropriate was to give them discretion in relation to sharing information with, for example, the person's nearest relative or someone who resides with them. Currently, the hospital manager is required to provide a copy of the emergency detention certificate to these people, even if it contains very sensitive information that the patient may not want them to have. The provision in Section 3 was not introduced for hospital managers to exercise discretion as to whether it was practical to inform relatives, carers or named persons discretion. The discretion would not be available if Amendment 67 is agreed to. I would hope it would be possible uh, for Dr Simpson concerns to be addressed through the Code of Practice, which could set it in further detail the circumstances, circumstances when and how that discretion should be used. And I'd be uh, therefore very happy to have further discussions with uh, Dr Simpson to see if an alternative way uh, forward uh, can be agreed. On that basis, I would uh, invite Dr Simpson not to press Amendment 67, we can have that uh, discussion. Amendment 68 and consequential Amendment 69 would seem to go beyond the current role of the, other, uh, of the independent advocate under the Act and be dependent on the changes in Amendment 67, which I have already argued against, noting that the discretion is not in relation to the practicability of informing the nearest relative or person who resides with uh, the patient. So again, I would uh, request uh, Dr Simpson not to press Amendment 68 and 69. Dr Simpson to wind up, press withdraw. Um, I don't need to wind up, uh, convener, just to move us on, and I will not press these amendments. Okay. Um, yeah, I presume all other members are content with that. Thank you. Uh, we now then move to 
uh, call Amendment 68 in the name of uh, Dr. Richard Simpson. I've already debated uh, with Amendment 67. Um, Dr. Simpson, not withdraw. Right, not moving. Uh, the, the call Amendment 69 in the name of Dr. Richard Simpson. I've already withdraw. debated. Not moving. Uh, the question is that Amendment 69, no, no, that's the next one. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, the question uh, is that Section 4 to 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I now call uh, Amendment uh, 5 in the name of the Minister, group with amendments as shown in the groupings? Um, I'm I point out at this point that if Amendment 8 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 94 as preempted, and I also point out that if Amendment 95 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 70, um, uh, which are all preempted. Um, can I now call on the Minister to move Amendment 5 and speak to all amendments in the group? Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, our overall policy aims in relation to suspension of detention have always been to best realise the suggestions made in the McManus report. These recommendations including, included removing brief periods of suspension of detention from the cumulative total and aiding calculation of total periods by converting them to days rather than months. It also included a total cumulative uh, permissible period of suspension of 200 days, which could be extended by the Tribunal in a small number of cases where a patient reached the limit. But because the patient's individual mental state and care circumstances it was not yet appropriate to apply to vary the order. Our proposals will provide a sensible and workable framework for suspension of detention that suits the individual requirements of a patient and provide safeguards to ensure that it is used in the most appropriate way. I propose amendments 5 to 7 to provide for more effective legislation in relation to the suspension of detention to complement the changes already introduced into the Bill. Amendment 5 makes changes for compulsory treatment orders and interim compulsory treatment orders. It allows a single certificate to authorise either a single period of suspension of detention or a series of periods of suspension of detention. For compulsory treatment orders, any single continuous period of suspension of detention cannot exceed 200 days, and this change is to express this period in days rather than months in common with other changes in the Bill in relation to suspension of detention. Also, for Compulsory treatment orders, the amendment states that the maximum duration for any certificate authorising multiple periods of suspension of detention is six months. The aim of this amendment is to produce a consistent and administratively sensible system of suspension of detention in a way that is not burdensome to responsible medical officers and that can be used in the best interests of patients. The changes will also carry across to compulsion or orders by virtue of section 179 of the 2003 Act. Amendment 6 allows a single certificate to specify either a single period of suspension of detention or a series of periods of suspension of detention in respect of assessment orders. Amendment 7 relates to treatment orders, interim compulsion orders, compulsion order and restriction orders. Hospital, di hospital directions, transfer for treatment directions or temporary compulsion orders. The amendment allows a single certificate to specify either a single period of suspension of detention or a series of periods of suspension of detention. Any single period cannot exceed 90 days and this changes to address an anomaly where the bill expresses certain timescales in relation to the suspension of detention in months rather than days. It also states that the maximum period of time for any certificate authorising multiple periods of suspension of detention is uh, three months. Uh, the main changes to policy brought about amend by amendments 8 and 15 have the effect that any period of suspension authorised of up to eight hours does not count towards the total of 200 days. The bill, as introduced, did not count periods of up to 12 hours towards the total. We listened to concerns from stakeholders that twi 12 hours might not quite reflect the brief periods that the McManus report suggested should not be counted towards the cumulative total. Broadly speaking, suspension of detention is used in two different ways. Firstly, for short trips out of hospital, usually escorted during the working day. Secondly, for testing out, which sees the patient have an overnight stay out of hospital and eventually several nights out, out at a time. Testing out helps the patient and their care team to see how the patient will cope with being out of hospital when their order is revoked or varied to a community order. By changing the time period to eight hours, roughly the standard working day, we are ensuring that the first type of escorted suspension of detention does not count to the cumulative total, but testing out periods do. We believe this is the best reflection of the recommendations of the McManus report on this subject. The amendment also makes provision as to how periods of more than eight hours and less than 24 hours are counted towards the cumulative total. It also makes changes as to how the maximum cumulative period of 200 days is calculated and the manner of granting certificates. Amendment 8 
relates to compulsory treatment orders. Amendment 15 is in relation to a treatment order, interim compulsion order, compulsion order and restriction order, hospital direction, transfer for treatment order or temporary compulsion order. Amendments 9 and 16 make clear that where the tribunal approves an additional 100 days suspension of detention, it does so by an order. Amendments 10 and 17 remove certain text from section 9 of the bill related to how the additional 100 days of suspension of detention that could be authorised by the tribunal. This is as a consequence of other amendments. Amendments 11 and 18 will clarify requirements in the small number of cases where a responsible medical officer applies for an extra 100 days of suspension of detention in relation to a patient's treatment. This will ensure that the Mental Welfare Commission receives notification that this has occurred to help with their wider monitoring of the 2003 Act. Amendments 12 and 19 will give patients and their named person the opportunity to make representations to the tribunal in relation to a hearing to extend the maximum total of cumulative detention or to vary order to community-based order. This will also ensure that the patient and named person will be informed of the result of the application. This adds to the safeguards for the patient in relation to any application to extend the total of cumulative detention. Amendment 13 is introduced in response to concerns that an extension of 100 days to the cumulative total of suspension of detention might be granted by the tribunal when it would be more appropriate to vary order to community-based order. Uh, the amendment gives the tribunal the ability to reject the additional 100 days and instead vary the order to a community-based order. This should both ensure that suspension of detention is not used on a long-term basis when a community-based order would be more appropriate. It should also avoid unnecessary extra hearings where the tribunal judges a community-based order more suitable. At the same time, by retaining the additional 100 days, we have kept the flexibility for the very small number of patients that McManus report identified as needing further testing out before a community-based order would be more appropriate. The dis disposal will be available in relation to a compulsory treatment order or compulsion order. Amendment 14 relates to suspension of measures other than the detention for compulsory treatment orders. It changes the maximum period of suspension of measures other than detention to 90 days from three months. Uh, this is uh, to be consistent with other changes made by the bill, which converts times and months to time and days to facilitate calculation of these periods. I proposed Amendment 21 to provide an additional safeguard for patients. It will only apply for the small number of patients where an application is made to extend the maximum cumulative limit by a further 100 days. It allows certain persons, including the patient and named person, to appeal the decision of the tribunal in relation to varying the order to a community-based order. Uh, I will not uh, be moving Amendment 20, and I thank the committee for uh, their understanding in relation to this. The intention behind this was to provide a consistent approach in line with Amendment 13, but for certain other orders and directions. However, in further reflection, I am not satisfied that it is appropriate to confer powers on the tribunal to vary those orders and directions to remove the detention requirement. The tribunal does not elsewhere in that Act have powers to remove the detention element of these orders. We do not want to introduce, it, introduce this only in relation to where an application to the tribunal has been made to increase the total period of suspension of detention. Suspension of detention in relation to these orders is for rehabilitative purposes. Converse the community-based order as a formal decision in relation to their order. For a compulsion order and restriction order, uh, the compulsion order would only be varied when the restriction order has been lifted. If a patient subject to hospital direction or a transfer for treatment direction no longer requires to be detained in the hospital, and the mechanism would be for them to return to prison to serve the remainder of their sentence. Amendments 18a, 19a and 21a make consequential uh, changes to those amendments as a result of the intention not to move Amendment 20 by removing references to subsection 12b, which would have been inserted by that amendment. Uh, I am grateful to you, uh, convener, for accepting these manuscript uh, amendments. Uh, the amendments proposed in this section by Dr Simpson uh, look to alter or remove the ability of the tribunal to extend the 200-day cumulative limit of suspension of detention by a further uh, 100 days. Again, I would like to thank Dr Simpson uh, for bringing uh, these amendments uh, forward. Uh, as I have now described, we have responded to concerns that the cumulative total may be extended where conversion of community-based order would be more appropriate and brought in safeguards for the patient. patient amendments 94 and 95 would remove the ability to increase the the total of suspension of detention up to 100 days, although only in relation to compulsory treatment orders. Amendments 17 and 71 would only allow an extension by a further 30 days. I do not believe uh, this provides as much flexibility for the individual circumstances of the patient as the government suggested way forward does. And we have proposals to provide the best balance between a flexible system uh, that uh, meets individual needs and protection for uh, patients. And would ask that these amendments are not uh, pressed. And I move Amendment uh, 5. Thank you, Minister. I now move to Dr Richard Simpson to speak to Amendment 94 and other amendments in the group. Can I, first of all, thank the Minister for uh, addressing some of the concerns that were being expressed to the committee. Uh, I mean, there, there is a view that the um, community orders, which were one of the new things came in with the 2003 Act, have been highly successful. 
Uh, my only concern with the introduction that uh, the Minister has made is that he talks about a small number of patients, but we've actually got no indication as to what that actually means. Is that single digits? Is that you know, 30 or 40? Uh, how many in relation to the, uh, the uh, community treatment orders is, this, is likely to apply? However, I do recognise also that the Minister has gone some way to actually reinforcing the uh, patient's rights to actually say that this should not be extended and the tribunal's given some uh, powers now to ensure that it is not extended. But my amendments were based on the written evidence from the Welfare, Mental Welfare Commission because as it stands, I believe that the Act uh, with a 200-day period or change to nine months, uh, um, you know, changing from months to days, uh, it is sufficient. If by 200 days we really haven't got to the point of recognising um, that that period, perhaps longer with, it, with suspensions in between, because it can be a series of periods amounting in total to 200 days, but over a, a much longer period, if by that time that there is no decision being made as to whether the patient should continue under what is a, still a restrictive order. It is obviously better than being detained within hospital, but it's still a restrictive order. Then uh, I, I just um, there is a feeling, which has been expressed by a number of witnesses, that, they, that this is uh, inappropriate and we should leave the Act as it is and decisions should be made by the 200 days. So that is the, the first amendment. The second set of amendments, which actually will only occur provided the first lot are not passed, uh, is an alternative, which is to allow 30 days uh, beyond the original 100 days to allow a very short period of extension rather than the, a further 100 days, which is 50% of the original, uh, the original period, which does seem to me still to be, uh, to be rather excessive. And I'm not sure why 100 days was actually decided upon as opposed to a shorter period, which would have allowed those concerned with the patient's health to uh, determine whether continuation of the compulsory order uh, w w was appropriate or not, um, or whether some other order should be put in place, or the patient should be moved to a, an, an entirely voluntary basis. If by 200 days the patient is not seen to be taking their medication, for example, which is one of the things under the compulsory treatment order, uh, frequently enough to, to, to warrant them actually relapsing or to, to, to contribute to their relapse, uh, then um, you know, I can understand that they may wish to extend it for a further period of time. So in conclusion, convener, I welcome the fact that the minister has gone some way to addressing my concerns. I'm not sure if he's gone far enough, but I will um, wait to see what he's summing up is, uh, before making a decision on how to proceed. Any other member wish to participate in the debate? I don't have any indications um, that any other member wishes to speak at this time. Can I... Um Ask the Minister then to, to wind up and respond. Okay, thank you. We've taken on board some of what has been raised by Dr. Simmons. I should say it's not at this stage been possible to get exact figures on how many patients reach the current nine month. However, the snapshot that we've seen, the figures we have received from the Commission suggest there are very few reach this limit, it's likely to be single figures. In terms of our approach, and you know, let me recognise there's validity in terms of what. Dr Simpson says, I, th I think there is still merit in having a more flexible uh, system which our amendments would uh, uh, allow for. I think that's more in line with uh, what was uh, recommended in the uh, McManus uh, approach. And uh, on that basis, I would urge that uh, the committee support the amendments presented by the government. Thank you, Minister. We now, uh, the, the question now is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, I call Amendment uh, 6 in the name of the Minister. I've already debated with Amendment 5. Minister, you move formally. Please. Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister. I've already debated with Amendment 5. Minister, to move formally. Yes, moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. The question is then that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Uh, call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister. Already debated uh, with Amendment 5. Minister, to move forward. Moved, can you? Thank you. Um, I remind uh, uh, members at this point that if Amendment 8 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 94 as previously, previously indicated. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, there is a division. 
Um, can I ha have a show of hands, please? Raise your hands for th all those in um, uh, favour of the amendment. Um, those against the amendment? Abstentions? Uh, the result of the amendment is therefore agreed to. Um, we now move to amendment 95. And I call, I call uh, amendment 95 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. I already debated with amendment 5. Dr Richard Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Um, uh, I call amendments then for amendments 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 9 to 13 in block. It moved, Convener. Thank you. Uh, does any member object to the, the single question being put on the amendments 9 to 13? No. Um, the question is then that amendments 9 to 13 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I now call amendment 70 in the name of Richard Simpson, already debated with amendment 5. Um, Dr Richard Simpson, to move or not move? Moved. Move. The question is that amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There is a division. Uh, those in favour of the amendment... Those against? Thank you. Um, the, for the Amendment 4, against the Amendment 5, the, the Amendment therefore is not agreed to. Uh, we now call Amendments 14, 15, 16 and 17, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Invite Minister to move amendments 14 to 17 in block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments uh, 14 to 17? Thank you. Uh, the question is then amendments 14 to. Oh, sorry, sorry, wait a minute then. Where are we? I've, I've rushed on, I'm sorry, Minister. Can I invite the Minister to move amendments 14 to 17? A bit of wishful thinking there, but anyway. <laughs> Moved, I'm sure we've got to go through. The, the, uh, invite Minister to move amendments 14 to 17 in block. Moved, Convener. Thank you. Um, the question then, uh, of course, is that amendments 14 to 17 are agreed to. No, well, you put me off it. All together. Is there any member uh, uh, object to to put the question in each amendment and individually? We're all agreed to to have those amendments in block. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Uh, are are we are we all agreed to the amendment? Yes. Right. She was. <laughs> Just as well, we're all agreed to that one. I think. Can I now call amendment? 18 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 5. Moved. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Um, can I call a, Amendment 18A in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 5. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 18A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 5. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 19A in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 5. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 19A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 5. Minister, to move on? It not moved. It can be not right. moved. Um, 
Can I now then call Amendment 71 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, already d debated with not Amendment moved. 5, not move. Okay. Um, I then call Amendment 21 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 5. Minister, to move forward. It moved, can you? Thank you, Minister. I call Amendment 21A in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 5. Minister, to move forward. Excuse me, not. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 21A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question uh, is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. Uh, I now call amendments 22, 23 and 96, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move amendments 22, 23 and 96 in block. It moved, Convener. Thank you. Does any member object to the single question being put on amendments 22, 23 and 96? I have no objection. Um, the question is then that amendments 22, 23, 96 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I now call amendment 24 in the name of the Minister, grouped with other amendments as shown in the grouping? I point out um, that if Amendment 26 is agreed to, I cannot call amen Amendment uh, 73 um, as it's preempted. Ministers, uh, Minister to move Amendment 24 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, this group of amendments relate to an important issue. I hope you'll understand that uh, I take some time to talk about the uh, Government's position. The Government's stated intention was set out in the draft amendments, draft regulations and a dra draft timetable for the introduction of the right of appeal out with the State Hospital provided to the committee on the 24th of April. I hope the committee has found that helpful in clearly setting out our position and demonstrating our commitment to bringing effective regulations into force as soon as possible after Royal Assent. This group it relates to sections 10 to 12 of the Bill, which make amendments to the sections of the 2003 Act relating to appeals against being detained in conditions of excessive security in the state hostel and in hospitals other than the state hostel. I'm not. I'm going to uh, focus uh, first on the uh, those amendments that only relate to hostels other uh, than the uh, state hospital, as they go to the heart of the differences between the, the government's approach and the alternative approach that appears to be uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Simpson. These are amendments 26 to 31. Firstly, it's uh, clear from the debate on those uh, these provisions at the time of the bill for the 2003 Act that the intention of introducing them was to enable patients in the state hospital and those in the future and medium secure units to seek to move to a lower level of security. That was the Millen recommendation. The bill seeks to ensure that this intention is fulfilled and these amendments build on that intention. As far as the government is concerned, what is needed at this present time is to take the scheme provided for in 2003 and ensure it can operate effectively in the present secure estate. We do not seek to extend that scheme to persons or purposes that it was never intended uh, to cover. And it's clear that this scheme has always been about a move from one place to another. It's not about challenging the imposition of particular measures of security in the place that the patient is in. Uh, this is clear when considered the only available remedy is a move to another hostel or unit and not, for example, an order for certain measures to be lifted. If there was a wish to change the nature of the appeal in a way that it could be sensibly extended to all patients, that would require a more fundamental reworking of the scheme set out in the 2003 Act, which has not been consulted on. As far as I'm aware, there's no consensus in favour of this. The committee in its Stage 1 report asked for consideration to be given as to whether the scenario where an individual in a low-secure setting could appeal and move from one level of security to another and still remain in low-secure accommodation is an appropriate one to merit inclusion of the right of appeal for individuals in low-secure settings. I'll answer that. As I've explained, the scheme provided for in the Act is not about challenging particular measures, including the measure of being uh, locked. I don't consider that scenario to be one where the level of security is excessive, and that is what we are talking about here, levels of security that go beyond the proper limit or degree. In general, patients in low security would initially be cared for within a ward for a period of time, 
and then to have gradually increasing periods of time out with the ward within the wider hostel environment, either escorted or unescorted, then community access progressing to overnight passes and finally uh, discharge. You've already considered amendments that allow for patients being treated in hospital to have access to the community for up to uh, 200 days, possibly even up to 300 days with tribunal agreement and every 365 days. There are other applications that may be made under the 2003 Act that would allow such patients to seek to vary or revoke their detention orders. We should also be mindful of the fact that everyone discharging functions under this Act has a legal duty to do so in a manner that appears to them to involve the minimum restriction on the freedom of the patient as necessary in the circumstances. I will be interested in Dr Simpson's explanation of his amendments if they are intended to lay the groundwork for regulations which do not limit the right of appeal to patients in medium secure units, then with respect, I will be unable to uh, support them. If it is this government's clear position uh, that the right to make an application under section 268 should be made available to patients in me medium secure units only, we cannot support amendments which seek to provide. Uh, otherwise, if that is not the intention, uh, I would nonetheless prefer my pr pr proposed uh, approach, which seeks to build on what is currently in the Act by providing additional powers to make regulations in relation to the test to be applied by the tribunal, as well as making provision for supportive medical reports. I will go on to discuss these and I hope I persuade you that my proposed approach is the better option. In terms of delivering the current scheme, Amendments 26 to 29 aim to ensure that the core element of the test currently set out in the 2003 Act remains unaltered, whilst allowing flexibility for the test to be refined through subsequent regulations by the addition of extra limbs to the test, should experience of the tribunal's operation of the test indicate a need for it to be uh, refined. Uh, amendments 26 and 27 do this by replacing the requirement for the tribunal to be satisfied before making an order that detention of the patient in the qualifying hostel involves the patient being subject to a level of security that is excessive in the patient's case with the requirement the tribunal may only make an order if it is satisfied that the test specified in regulations under new section 271A introduced by Amendment 29 is met in relation to the patient. Amendment 28 is similar, but it would require the tribunal to be satisfied that the test specified in regulations is not met in relation to the patient before uh, an order can be recalled. Amendment 29 introduces the new section 271A setting out regulation making powers relating to detention and conditions of excessive security. It allows for a definition of qualifying hostel so that the scheme provided for in 2003 can operate effectively in the present secure state by allowing those in the medium secure units to seek a move to a lower level of security. It provides a framework for the test that must be met for the tribunal to make an order that the patient has been detained in conditions of excessive security. That test must include a requirement that the tribunal be satisfied that detention of the patient in the hostel in which the patient is being detained involves the patient being subject to a level of security that is excessive in the patient's case. It allows regulations to include further requirements for the test to be met in relation to a patient. And this could, in the future, include factors like the impact on a patient's care and treatment if they were to be moved, if that was felt to be an important consideration. It allows for flexibility around the test in light of changes in practice and in light of the tribunal's experience of hearing appeals and the subsequent effect on patients. Of course, anything that was included in regulations is subject to scrutiny by this uh, committee and uh, by uh, Parliament. Uh, Amendment 31 will make regulations under the new section 271A subject to the affirmative procedure. Amendment 30 is a minor technical amendment to reorder the words in the first line of the definition of relevant patient so, so that instead of is authorised and hostile it reads and hostile is authorised, uh, this has no impact on the effect of the provision. Uh, now I'll turn to uh, those amendments that relate to appeals under section 10 to 12 of the bill, whether they relate to the state hostel or hostels other than the state hostel. Those are amendments 24, 25, 32 and 33. In relation to amendment 24, we know that appeals that have the support of a medical practitioner are significantly more likely to succeed. Of the first 100 state hostel patients to make an application, 93% of those who were successful had responsible medical officer support. And those whose applications were unsuccessful, 91% did not have responsible medical officer support. Research into the first 100 state hostel patients to appeal found that 23% of appeals were rejected and a further 23% were withdrawn. There may be a number of reasons at play here, but it would not be unreasonable to assume that in the majority of these 46% of cases, there would not have been a supportive report by a medical practitioner. This amendment would allow a medical practitioner to consider a patient's case and assess whether in their opinion the test that is intended to be set out in regulations is met or not. It will not prevent any appeals which would have succeeded without the new requirement for a supportive report by a medical practitioner, additional criteria that a medical practitioner might be required to meet 
could be set out in the regulations introduced by Amendment 29. Amendment 25 takes out subsection 9 of section 10 of the Bill. Uh, this subsection was included in the Bill in the introduction to allow an application to be made, even if one had previously been made and then withdrawn. However, in further reflection, we are not persuaded of the need for this provision. We are not aware in the 10 years of operation of appeals from the State Hospital that the Act's provisions which allow which only allow for one application per 12-month period in respect to the same patient has been a real issue. There have not been calls for change and following discussions with the Tribunal. We have also taken into consideration the possibility of applications being made and multiple and withdrawn multiple at times from uh, any of the people with the right to make an application, the resulting potential impact on an increase in Tribunal hearings. On balance, therefore, it was felt that we should maintain the considered position as set out in the 2003 Act. We are, however, of course, open to considering this matter again if there is evidence of a practical issue. Amendment 32 sets a new subsection which provides that in that chapter a reference to hospital may be read as a reference to hospital unit. And for the purposes of the chapter, hospital unit means any part of a hospital which is treated as a separate unit. This will, for example, mean that the duty on a health board under section 2683 to identify a hospital can be fulfilled by identifying a hospital unit, whether or not in the same hospital as the patient is currently detained. Finally, uh, Amendment 33 removes section 12 of the bill, which, is, which inserted the new section 272A into the 2003 Act, as its terms are now included in other provisions, power to make regulations and the definition of qualifying hostel. And the question of whether a patient's detention in the hostel involves the patient being subject to excessive security are instead found in new section 271A, introduced by Amendment 29, and provision in relation to hostel units extending to all of Chapter 3, not just provisions related to patients not in the state hostel, as in section 2732, introduced by Amendment 32. It can be our move, Amendment 24, my name. Thank you, Minister. I uh, now call on Dr Richard Simpson to speak to Amendment 72 and all other amendments in the group. Thank you very much. Uh, can I begin by welcoming the proposals both in the Bill and the amendments as proposed by the Minister? Um, the, these appeals against the level of detention being applied now in medium secure units as being overly restrictive are very welcome. It was, as the Minister has said, one of the major principles of the Milan Commission, uh, which was incorporated into the 2003 Act, that restrictions should be at the minimum level compatible with the safety of the patient and the safety of others. Now, hitherto, this has meant that there could be appeals against uh, continued excessive security found in the state hospital. But at the time we passed that Act, there was only one medium secure unit, that was Orchard House in Edinburgh, and the numbers who were being held in the state hospital were more than twice those that are currently held. We do now have the additional medium secure units at Stubb Hill and the U unit at Murray Royal uh, Infirmary in, my, in Perth in my constituency. And I very much welcome the fact that the Minister tabled the regulations um, at an early stage which allowed us to be very clear that this is about appeal against the uh, restriction in those units uh, and that's to be very welcome. But the purpose of my amendments is to take us further. Uh, if we look back to 2003, and as I've said, we had the state hospital, we had one medium secure unit, uh, the, the possibilities for transfer were not, were not particularly high. But the situation now is that we have low secure units. Uh, we have units which are the state hospital level, medium secure units, and low secure units. But these are not actually discrete they, they are increasingly, with, uh, as we go forward, there will be different levels of security, in my view, within the low secure units. And in, 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 in line with the Milan uh, Commission uh, requirement that the restrictions should be at a minimum level, I believe that the time has come to consider uh, whether, in fact, people should have the right of appeal without having to appeal against the detention order itself. They should be able to appeal against being held in a particular low secure unit and should be able to move to another low secure unit which may have different, uh, a, a different approach. And that is the, the purpose of the amendments which are in my name table today. Now, I recognise, however, that uh, in discussions with mental health professions, that whilst they are ready for the changes proposed by the government in respect of medium secure units, they are not ready yet to look at the question of tackling low secure units and therefore actually having this in regulations would be more sensible because they can be then uh, put through at a time in which the, um, the service is actually re ready to deal with it. The question I would ask the Minister in summing up is whether he agrees in principle that we should now be looking at the matter of transfer 
between low secure units or whether he believes the time is not ripe. If he believes that the time is not ripe and therefore doesn't accept the principle at this time, uh, I take it that he would not be prepared to work with me to uh, uh, produce suitable amendments uh, at stage three. I would hope that he might, however, undertake that uh, if he is agreeing in to a, a, um, a major review of the Act at a future date, um, which I hope he will do later when we come to further amendments, that this will be an element that's contained within that, because I do believe that we have to actually move to giving the patients greater rights against detention in a particular type of secure unit. Uh, this is reinforced by the fact that the minister th himself has moved from changing, f uh, changing the situation from appeal against a hospital to appeal against a unit. And it's actually the differentiation between the units that are going to become increasingly supportive. So my amendments would actually future-proof this bill at this time. Um, and I am uh, will conclude at that point. Uh, are there any other amendments? I know uh, Bob Doris and Rhoda Grant. Oh, sorry, myself first. Yes. Um, um, thanks, Convener, and I listened carefully to the, the arguments uh, from both the Minister and, and Dr Simpson. This is a matter that I was kind of looking at in the run-up to whether to lodge amendments at, at stage uh, two. Also, I, I found some of the Minister's comments um, quite interesting. It got me thinking a bit more about whether or not uh, appealing against low security is actually an appeal against excessive security or against security itself. And I think there was a point well made within that, that the various settings within low secure actually may be part of a continuum and a preparation towards a community disposal for someone who's in the low secure setting. Um, so I'm just wondering some more information about whether at medium secure settings, for example, are there various levels of security within medium secure? Because I'm understanding the amendment within this bill specifically allows you to appeal against medium secure rather than the various types of settings within medium secure settings. Uh, so therefore, I'd be more content with the, the Minister's suggestions on the basis that if we're viewing the low secure setting as a continuum towards a potential community disposal, and we heard on the record the, the possibility to suspend a CTO by 200 days, I'm also wondering whether the Minister would agree perhaps there's more work to get a greater understanding of precisely what happens in relation to, in a low secure setting and preparing those who have their, uh, their liberty um, withdrawn from the low secure setting and preparing uh, uh, for the community. Uh, at this stage, I think I'm minded to, to support the, the Minister's position, but I think Dr Simpson does make some, some interesting points that requires further discussion at a later date about how we look at various settings of security within low secure and indeed both uh, medium and the state hospital itself, convener. Thank you, Rosa Grant. Um, thank you, convener. Um, Sam H have raised some concerns about um, amendments in this group. Um, firstly, on Amendment 29, um, that defines a qualifying hospital, and to be, you must be in a qualifying hospital to appeal against detention on the grounds of excessive security. Their concern is that it should be the conditions in which a patient is held rather than the hospital that they are held in, so I look forward to the Minister's um, comments on that. They also um, flag up concerns with 24 and 25, um, 24 um, where uh, a, an appeal must be accompanied by a medical practitioner's report. Now, if I heard um, the Minister correctly when he spoke to this amendment, um, he said that 91% of um, appeals were rejected if they weren't accompanied by a medical pr practitioner's report. However, that would say that there are 9% that do um, go through without that support. And I, I wonder what would happen to those um, appeals if this amendment were to be passed. And um, lastly, Amendment 25 about the withdrawals of appeal. Now, I heard what the Minister said in his remarks, saying that he would consider evidence on this if it seemed to provide a barrier. But it seems to me that if you withdraw an appeal and then you can't lodge a further appeal in 12 months if your circumstances have changed, that seems like a long period of time um, to elapse before you can do that. So I'd also welcome his concerns and although acknowledge that he said he would look at this again if evidence came forward. Thank you. No other members? Uh, Minister? Okay, can you members? Things have been 
uh, remarked upon, so let me try and pick uh, everything up as, as well as I, I can. I mean, I think the first point is to say that Mr Doris is uh, correct. This would be an appeal against the level, not about the specific uh, circumstances at, uh, at the at medium secure uh, levels uh, within the estate. Uh, Rhoda Grant uh, suggests that uh, Sam H have uh, concerns about uh, the fact that we've worded about the qualifying hospital, and she says it should be about the, the condition um, uh, uh, that the patient is held in. I, I would suggest that's a bit of a moot point because the condition they're held in is defined as being held in a medium secure estate, but I, I'm obviously always happy to uh, look at any other concerns that are expressed in relation to uh, Rudy Grant's other uh, concerns about uh, what would happen to. Uh, She's right that I did mention 91% of those uh, who made an application uh, were, that were unsuccessful did not have a responsible medical officer uh, in support. I should say that was only of the first 100 uh, state hospital patients to make uh, an application. So it's of that particular uh, sample. She asked what would have happened to the 9% who were successful. Well, I think I tried to cover that in my open remarks. They, they would still be successful because not under these uh, regulations, they would have had to get the a report in the first instance uh, and then would have been successful when they went forward just because they I mean they, they didn't have to have the report before I suppose is the point so now they would uh, 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 get that in, in support of their uh, particular application and still be uh, successful would be my uh, expectation uh, in relation to uh, Dr Simpson's uh, amendments he has set out a, a different approach I uh, understand his perspective uh, Entirely, I think he did make the point that uh, the professionals in the field do not feel uh, that at this stage they would be ready for uh, the approach that he has uh, set out. Um, I do, of course, agree that we should always be looking at reinforcing patient rights. That's why we brought forward these uh, amendments. I'm not convinced that at this stage we should go with uh, Dr Simpson's uh, preferred uh, way forward. Uh, I should say he asked to know could we have a discussion about this. I'm, of course, uh, always happy to have that dialogue, so let me commit uh, to doing that. But um, I do uh, rather suspect that this may be a, a something, if we were to look at, would be a longer term a thing rather than being achieved through this bill. OK, thanks for that. Um, the question is then that um, Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, call Amendment 25 in the name of the Minister. Are already, already debated with Amendment 24. Minister, to move formally. It moved. Thank you. The question is then, Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is then that Section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I now call Amendment 22, uh, 72 in the name of uh, Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Dr uh, uh, Simpson, to move or not move? Not move. Not move. I then call Amendment 26 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 24. Minister, to move formally. It moved, convener. Thank you. Uh, can I uh, remind again that uh, members that if Amendment 26 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 73. Uh, uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. There is a, a division. Uh, all those in favour of the amendment, please raise. Those against? Those abstaining? For the Amendment 5, um, against the Amendment none, abstentions 4, the Amendment is therefore agreed to. I uh, now call Amendment 74 in the name of uh, Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Uh, Dr Richard Simpson, to move or not move? Not move. Not move. I then call Amendment 75 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, and just for the record, uh, I've already debated with Amendment 24. Dr Simpson, to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Um, I call Amendment then 76 
in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. I've already debated with amend Amendment 24. Uh, Dr Simpson, to move or not move? Not move. I then call Amendment 77 uh, in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. I've already debated with Amendment 24. Dr Simpson, to move or not move? Not move. Um, I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister. I've already debated with Amendment 24. Minister, to move formally. Moved, Convener. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I move to call Amendment 78 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. I've already debated with Amendment 24. Dr Simpson, move or not move? Not move. Not move. I now call Amendment 79 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. I've already debated with Amendment 24. Dr Simpson, move or not move? Not move. Okay. Um, I now call Amendments 28, 29, 30 and 31, all in the name of the Minister and previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 28 to 31 in block. Does any member object to the single question being put on the amendments 28 to 31? No objection. Um, uh, the question is then that amendments... I've, I've you have not moved, not moved again. again. Yeah. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> you should remember you're here, Minister. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask the Minister uh, to, to, to move? You're keeping me on my toes today. I oh, can be moved. You're helping me out. And I'm appreciative. Um, the question is then that amendments 28 to 31 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call amendment 80 in the name of Richard Simpson. Already debated with amendment 24. Uh, Dr. Simpson, move or not move? Not move. Not move. Um, the question uh, then is that section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, call amendment 32 in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment 24. Minister, to move formally. It moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I now call Amendment 33 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 24. Minister to move. Fondly, thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are. Thank you. Um, uh, section 13. The question is that Section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I'm proposing at this point... Um, uh, hopefully with your agreement to have a 10 minute comfort break and, and then we will resume for another approximately another hour at 10 past ok, okay. thank you for that
We, can we now uh, reconvene? <laughs> Can we welcome Adam Ingram to the meeting? There's an amendment coming up later, in a wee while. <laughs> we hope. Um, can we now um, call Amendment 34 in the name of the Minister Group with Amendments 97, 98, 35 and 81. Uh, Minister, to move Amendment uh, 34 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the Scottish Government's key reason for amending this provision was to make the maximum period of detention and the purposes of that detention clearer for everyone involved, particularly around detention being for the purposes of the medical examination. I am very clear that the provision does not extend the period of detention. The maximum period of detention under the provisions introduced by the Bill remains, as now, three hours. The only difference is that the maximum period of detention under the 2003 Act is currently for a period of two hours extendable to three, and under the Bill's proposals, the maximum period will be three hours from the outset. I consider this added clarity will be beneficial to service users and will not result in patients being detained for any longer than under the current legislation. It's also important to note that the three hours is an upper limit, not a fixed period. The provision will be accompanied by clear updated guidance in the Code of Practice, which will confirm that the provision should be used in line with the principle of least restriction. A working group has been set up involving a range of stakeholders to advise the Government on updates to the Code. Aside from the issue of the maximum period of detention, I am aware that a number of stakeholders have concerns that the proposals could result in the restriction of a service user's liberty. Amendment, Amendment 35 responds to those, these concerns by removing the provision which would allow the nurse's holding power to be used for the purpose of detaining the patient to ensure that they did not leave the hospital before the granting of an EDC or STDC. Uh, on reflection, I do not uh, believe that this would be in line with the principle of least uh, restriction. Uh, Amendment 34 simply removes certain text from section 14 that is no longer uh, required because of the changes made by Amendment 35. Uh, I turn to Amendments 97 and 98 in the name of Nanette Milne. Amendment 98 is intended to remove any suggestion that patients must actively leave the hospital before nurses can exercise the holding power. I am not convinced that this addresses a, a significant practical problem. The Mental Welfare Commission's guidance covers the fine line between encouraging a patient to stay in hospital, which does not require use of the nurse's power to detain under Section 299 of the 2003 Act, and telling the patient they cannot leave and will be restrained the moment they try to do so, which would, it could amount to de facto detention and should normally trigger use of the power. Amendment 97 is a structural amendment necessary to allow uh, Amendment 98 uh, to work at Aston and at Milne not to press the amendments. Amendment 81 would uh, remove uh, uh, the entirety of section uh, 41. I believe it is right to remove the provision which would have allowed the uh, nurses uh, holding it uh, to be used for the purpose of detaining the patient to ensure that they did not leave the hospital before the granting of uh, an emergency detention certificate or a short-term uh, detention certificate as covered by amendments 34 and 35. However, I believe that the nurses holding power will benefit from being made more clear in terms that its purpose is for arranging a medical examination that is clear to the patient from the outset that power can last for up to three hours. I therefore ask uh, Dr Simpson not to press his amendment. Can we move uh, Amendment uh, 34 in my name? Thank you, Minister. Can I call Nanette Millen to speak amend uh, to Amendment 97? And all other amendments in the group. Yes, th thank you, Convener. I appreciate the Minister's comments, and I think what he said probably does actually um, make my amendments more or less redundant. But uh, the, reason, the reason for bringing them was that basically the, the subsection 3B of the of section 299 of the 2003 Act basically said that it requires only where necessary for the protection of health, safety or welfare of the patient or the safety of any other person, the patient be immediately restrained from leaving the hospital. It was the four words, leaving the, leaving the hospital, that the amendments sought to address. The Law Society has highlighted that these words have caused confusion, leaving a question as to whether detention under this section is lawful when a patient hasn't made any overt attempt to, to, to leave the hospital. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, uh, Thanks. Um, call Richard Simpson to speak to Amendment 81 and other amendments in the group. Uh, can I begin by saying, Convener, that I welcome Amendments 34 and 35 as clarifying 
uh, aspects of the nurses prior to detention. But my amendment was made before these amendments were tabled or was formulated before these amendments were tabled. Um, and I might have therefore done it slightly differently. Um, my amendment to delete the whole of section four, to return the situation to status quo ante, uh, was made because both the, the Sam H and Royal College of Nursing um, representative, that's the chair of the mental health section, and then Mental Health Nursing Forum Scotland, uh, were of the view that this was unnecessary. This amendment was unnecessary. That is the change from two hours with an extension to three to three. It does appear like a tidying up amendment, but it is again suggesting that actually, although the minister has said this would be a maximum, of course, <coughs> knowing as I do the way things go, it's actually likely to drift towards the maximum because the maximum is there. The two hours extending to three was a deliberate thing within the 2003 Act. Now, if the minister had produced some justification from the government based on a statistical analysis or data collection for this proposal, I, I would have uh, been more happy to support it. But as Mr. Barron said, and I quote from our report, we do not even know where this proposal came from. It certainly did not come from, from nurses. And that seems to me a real problem. So I remain confused as to where this came from. Furthermore, the supposition that without considerable enhancement of both the numbers and availability of mental health officers, it appears unlikely that this proposal, if this is what it's about, will lead to a greater involvement of MHOs. We know that they're already under pressure, and I don't think that changing the situation is going to increase uh, the involvement of MHOs in this situation. And whilst it's certainly true that psychiatry is also facing significant challenges at the present time, particularly in view of the fact that the latest report from the Royal College indicates that 42% of all those psychiatrists in training completing the foundation exams are emigrating, the failure in workforce planning should not be a, a basis for changing something and extending it to allow a lot smaller number of psychiatrists the opportunity of attending for the purposes of a medical examination. So overall, this, in my view, is unnecessary diminution of the rights of, of the patient's rights and should be deleted. However, had I seen the amendments 34 and 35 before, I would have moved simply to return the situation to uh, the status quo ante with the enhanced power that they could only be detained for the purposes of a medical examination. Um, and I will uh, look at that in probably in stage three. Any other member wish to take part in the debate? No other member? Okay. The question is that... Um, oh, Minister, again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, convener. I'll uh, confirm my remarks. I won't uh, <laughs> say too much. Can I first of all thank Nanette Milne for uh, her comments, comments? I'm glad she uh, perceived it to be the case that what we've uh, laid here take. I think she said that it takes care of uh, her concerns. Turn to Dr. Simpson's uh, perspective. I mean, we, we could have run around and sought to bring forward a statistical justification for uh, the uh, change that we uh, her. Uh, uh, or the position that we are uh, taking. I shouldn't call it a change because I don't perceive it to be a change, particularly I think that what will, is on the face of the bill just now is uh, far clearer uh, for uh, patients than uh, the position just now. I think if they know at the outset that the maximum they could be held is for a three-hour period, whereas at the moment it's two hours extendable to three, I don't particularly consider it to be a great diminution of patients' rights, uh, and particularly when you consider the other safeguards we've put in here. I think this is an enhanced level of patient rights. I think this offers greater clarity for the patient. I hear that the RCN and indeed the RCN have made a submission to the government setting out the position. I have to say they haven't sought to meet with me directly. I'm meeting them later today in relation to another matter. So this may be something that we can discuss. But I am comfortable with the position that we have put in the face of the bill. And I would urge members to support the uh, government amendments and uh, reject the amendments in the name of uh, Richard Simpson and uh, if Ms Milne, uh, Dr Milne, sorry, uh, chooses to push her amendment, reject that as well. Okay then, the question therefore is that amendment 34 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, now call Amendment 97 in the name of Nanette Millen. Already debated with Amendment 34. Nanette Millen to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Uh, therefore, call on Amendment 98 in the, nate of, in the name of Nanette Millen. Already debated with Amendment 34. Nanette Millen to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Call Amendment 35 in the name of the Minister. I've already debated with Amendment 34. Minister, to move forward. It moves, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. I now call Amendment 81 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. I've already debated with Amendment 34. Dr Simpson, move or not move? Move. Move. The question is that Amendment 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour of the amendment? Those against? No abstentions. The, for the Amendment 4, against the Amendment 5, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 36 in the name of the Minister and a group on its own. Um, Minister to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, amendment uh, 36 it removes uh, Section 15 of the Bill as introduced, which would have shortened the period for appeal against transfer to the State Hospital from 12 weeks to 28 days. This amendment means that patients will continue to have 12 weeks to appeal under Section 220 of the Act against their transfer. Uh, this provision was intended to ensure that potential treatment was not delayed. However, we have listened to the views of uh, stakeholders and indeed of uh, this committee about the potential difficulties for patients to appeal in the proposed time scale of 28 days and accept that these concerns outweigh the potential benefits. I therefore move Amendment 36. Thank you. Any members wish to participate in this debate? No. Minister, I don't presume you would wish to wind up. The question, therefore, then, is that uh, Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we now call uh, Amendment 37 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendments 38 and 39. Minister, to move Amendment 37 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. Amendment 37 amends Section 16 of the Bill to make it clear that in relation to compulsory treatment orders, the periodical referral by the Tribunal is to take place where no application has been determined by it rather than made to it in the preceding two years. This will avoid the situation where a review is not triggered because an application has been made to the Tribunal and then withdrawn by the patient. It makes this consistent with the changes made to two-year reviews of uh, compulsion orders and restriction orders by Section 16 of uh, the Bill. Amendment 38, it makes an amendment consequential upon men, Amendment 37, so that Paragraph 13A of Schedule 2 is repealed in its entirety as it is no longer necessary. Uh, section 16 of the Bill is intended to solve a genuine problem that has led to reviews under Section 189 being uh, delayed. Uh, the need for uh, a Section 189 reference is currently calculated by whether a reference was made in the two years prior to the relevant day which is the anniversary of uh, the order, as I described in relation to Amendment 37. The provisions in uh, Section 16 particularly relate to where a review is uh, not triggered because an application is made to the tribunal then withdrawn by the patient. This can lead to substantial delays to the two-year review. Uh, I therefore invite Dr Simpson not to press Amendment 99, given the benefits that will result from Section 16 of the Bill, and I move Amendment 37. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Dr Richard Simpson to speak to Amendment 99 and other amendments in the group. This amendment was raised with me by the Law Society, who uh, considered any reference should be dealt with efficiently and effectively by the Tribunal, thus avoiding any unnecessary delay in determining the reference. Patients should not be disadvantaged by delays in the Tribunal process and have a right to have their orders reviewed two yearly by reference the date uh, on which the reference is made to maintain consistency and to avoid confusion and to ensure that patients are not disadvantaged. It's two yearly reviews of all orders should be timetabled in the same way. But I think, if I'm hearing the Minister correct, that actually his further amendments uh, do deal with this issue. And subject to that, I will be content. Any other members? No. Minister? Tad, 
Um, the question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, call Amendment 38 in the name of the Minister. Already debated uh, with amend Amendment 37. Minister, to move forward. Now. It moved, Kavir. Okay. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, call Amendment 99 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 37. Uh, Dr Simpson, to move or not move? Yes, this amendment uh, deletes the section 17 in its entirety. And again, the Law Society have indicated to me that they feel this section depends upon the Scottish Government. Sorry, are you moving or not moving? Oh, sorry, was that moving or not moving? Yes. Oh, sorry, no, not, not moving, sorry. Okay. Pardon? You have to put the question 16. Section 16 Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... It's okay. John. It's okay. <laughs> um, uh, we then. Um, question of section 16. Right, so I now put the question um, uh, to seek agreement in uh, section 16. Yes, I agree. Agreed, thank you. Can I call Amendment 100 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson and the group on its own? Dr Simpson to move and speak to the amendment, amendment 100. This, this again has, has arisen from discussions <coughs> with the Law Society um, and would have the effect of deleting Section 17 from the Bill. Uh, this section uh, would appear to depend on the Scottish Government introducing statutory timescales which do not appear in the Bill. Accordingly, this section does not make sense as things currently stand, and they believe that the section should be deleted. Sorry. Sorry. Um, any other members? No. Minister? Thank you. Uh, convener Richard Simpson's amendment uh, makes the argument that there are, are no statutory timescales in the bill. That's not quite right. In the 2003 Act, there is at least one timescale for the tribunal that applies in section 69 in relation to the extension of short-term detention pending the termination of application. It's also possible that timescales could be, it could also be set by tribunal rules or provisions leave open the question of where the timescales uh, come from. I would argue that section 17 the bill could still have a purpose. However, having reflected on changes to the bill since it was originally consulted on, I'm uh, content to accept this uh, amendment. I would uh, support it and urge uh, members to vote for it. Dr Simpson? Mm -hmm. Press withdraw, I think. <laughs> the question, therefore, uh, is that amendment uh, 100 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Uh, can I now call amendment... Uh, 101 in the name of Adam Ingram, group with amendment 102. Adam Ingram to move amendment 101 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Although there are few people who would challenge the powers to keep mentally ill patients in a place of safety or a place of care, treatment with psychiatric drugs should not be the sole means of treating mental illness which appears to be the situation prevailing at the present time in Scotland. Many contend that physical health conditions which may underline, underlie mental illness too often go untreated within mental hospitals. Some 25% of long-stay patients have no record of health checks, for example. Similarly, people with uh, behavioural issues such as those on the autism spectrum may also be doubly disadvantaged. Treating people with autism spectrum disorders with psychiatric drugs has serious consequences, which are outlined in detail by autism rights in the written evidence to the committee. None of the current practice takes account of individual tolerance uh, of these drugs, and little is known of the effects of polypharmacy. To give one example, it's not current practice to record prescription of drugs for epilepsy within mental health institutions. Many people with autism also have epilepsy. It is not well known that seizure activity, even at subclinical level, can induce hallucinations with obvious dangers of misdiagnosis. Psychiatrists are not considered to be knowledgeable about autism, so access to other professional expertise is essential, particularly for people on the autistic spectrum. 
far greater care should be taken with psychotropic uh, drugs, and my amendment seeks to promote this. Some people cannot tolerate psychotropic uh, drugs at all, or can only tolerate them in tiny doses over a short period of time. So there has to be a real choice of treatment options for these people. It also should be noted that the NICE guidance on ASD states that psychotropic drugs should only be used for six weeks and discontinued if there is no significant improvement. That is a major change from current psychiatric practice and needs to be applied and respected. Amendments 101 and 102 are designed to address what appears to be the default position of psychotropic drug use in the treatment of mental illness in favour of a more holistic approach. Thank you. Any other members wish to speak, Dr Simpson? I speak in support of Adam Ingram's amendments. I think this is a very important issue. I would take issue with some of the things he said about uh, my psychiatric colleagues, if I can remind in my, uh, members of my declaration as a fellow of the college. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the issues he raises are important. I would like to add to it that one of my major concerns at the moment is the treatment of people with dementia in acute hospitals with psychotropic drugs. And this seems to me to be something which is... Uh, um, really uh, unacceptable. Um, this is, of course, not uh, being ordered by psychiatrists. This is being ordered by um, those in the, serving in the acute hospital, often without the use of liaison psychiatry. Uh, and it is a matter of grave concern to me that this is happening. In addition, of course, there is the question of the use of psychotropic drugs in care homes, which this committee has actually looked at on a previous occasion. And again, Although the care inspectorate have looked at this, I do not believe that, that it has been looked at in as effective a way as it might be. And that's despite the fact of excellent reports by the Mental Welfare Commission looking at these issues. So I think the general purpose of um, Mr Ingram's amendments are extremely welcome um, and um, they are worth, worthy of, of consideration. Lynette Millon. Yes, I would also speak in favour of, of Adam Ingram's amendments. And I think this is an opportunity to, to address something that has really been a running sore for quite a long time. There have been quite a lot of concerns expressed about the use of psychotropic drugs, both in acute hospitals and, as Richard Simpson said, in care homes. So I happily support this amendment, these amendments. Other members? Minister? Thank you. Can you can I say at the outset I recognise that Adam Ingram has introduced these amendments to highlight some strongly held concerns which have been raised by some individuals and organisations and let me commit to being very willing to meet with Mr Ingram and indeed uh, Dr Simpson and other members to discuss in greater detail any of the particular concerns they have uh, raised. Let me say at the uh, outset in relation to uh, the bill that we are, are presenting uh, to, or debating uh, today is obviously a very focused uh, uh, bill and uh, my slight concern here is that the area that Mr Ingram has brought forward uh, seeks to go slightly wider than what we have uh, before us. Uh, the 2003 Act is uh, designed to improve the safeguards of patients. All medical practitioners who are uh, giving treatment for a mental disorder must have regard to the principles that are set out in Section 1 of the 2003 Act and to any advanced statement that a patient makes. In particular, the Code of Practice already highlights the responsibilities that medical practitioners have, including that the views of the patient should be taken into account and that the patient should be given information assisted to understand the treatment and its aims and effect. My view is that the 2003 Act already makes adequate provision that treatment, including the use of uh, psychoactive substances, has appropriate safeguards in place, including that patients have the information they need to understand the treatment and to make their views uh, known. It might also be helpful to highlight provisions from uh, the Patient Rights Scotland Act 2001, which says that healthcare is to be patient focused, that is to say, anything done in relation to the patient must take into account the patient's needs, have regard to the importance of providing the optimum benefit to the patient's health and well being, allow and encourage the patient to participate as fully as possible in decisions related to the patient's health and well being, have regard to the importance of providing such information support as is necessary to enable the patient to, to participate in decisions in relation to any related processes, taking all steps to ensure that the patient is supplied with information and support in a form that is appropriate to uh, the patient's needs. So let me reiterate my willingness to meet Mr Ingram and others if they uh, so wish to 
uh, request such a, a meeting to discuss these issues, but I would urge Mr Ingham not to press his amendments, but if he does, I would urge members to vote against them. Adam Ingram, to wind up, please overthrow. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, certainly, I ought, I'd be more than happy to engage with the minister on this issue, and indeed, it would be very helpful if Dr Simpson accompanied me there. He'll keep me right, I've no doubt, uh, with his psychiatric, psychiatric colleagues in mind. Um, uh, I do think this is an issue, as both Dr Simpson and Nanette, Nanette Milne indicated, which has been something of a long-running issue. Uh, and I think it does need to be addressed. I hear what the Minister says about the scope of this bill, but um, perhaps if we could have the discussion uh, with a view perhaps to revisit, perhaps uh, at stage three, uh, I'd be grateful for that opportunity. And, and on that basis, uh, I seek to withdraw uh, the, the motion. Okay. Uh, Yep, members content with the, the withdrawal. Yes? Okay. Um, we now call Amendment 102 in the name of Adam Ingram. Already debated with Amendment 101. Adam Ingram to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Okay. We now then call Amendment 103 in the name of Nanette Millen, gro uh, grouped uh, with Amendments 39. 40, 41, 42, 43, 105 and 108. Nanette Millen to move Amendment 103 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, this amendment relates to the ability of a, person, or a patient to opt out of having a named person. Uh, unusually, perhaps, we're discussing opt-out provisions, as the Scottish Government stated in paragraph 90 of the policy memorandum, that a person should only have a named person if they chose to have one. But the bill, as it stands, does retain the default provisions in section 251 of the 2003 Act. In the bill, as it stands, any opt-out from having a named person requires to be in writing. <coughs> It's my view that such an opt-out should be able to be made by any means available. The Law Society has stated that this amendment would allow people to opt out, for example, by making an oral statement before the tribunal or by communi communicating that intention to an independent advocate. Now, I realise that, again, perhaps if my motion had been put down later, uh, uh, it, it, it would not be relevant because, uh, I, in fact, I think uh, the, the following... Um, Amendments do actually address some, the well, they remove the concerns by making it quite clear um, that a person does not have a named person unless they specifically say they want one. Thank you, Minister. To speak to Amendment Thirty and any other amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. The Stage One debate highlighted the importance of ensuring that individuals only have a named person if they choose to have one. Uh, I noted that I was likely to propose amendments to achieve this. The Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report recognised the need, if this was done, to provide protections for service users without capacity and who have not been able to appoint a named person. I will begin by addressing the amendments that I have proposed to this effect. Amendment 39 works with Amendment 40 to remove the default named person rule. Specifically, Amendment 39 removes Section 18 from the Bill, which allowed someone to opt out from having a named person but retain the default for those without the capacity to make the decision. It is Amendment 40 that removes the existing provisions for the default named person under the 2003 Act. The Government listened very carefully to concerns raised by stakeholders in relation to the default named person. We have taken their view that it can cause considerable distress to both patients and to their carers and relatives. Amendment 40 and its related consequential amendments will mean that a service user will only have a named person if they want one. Amendment 41. As a consequential amendment to Amendment 40, removing a reference to Section 251 of the Act from Section 19 of the Bill, Section 251 of the Act is repealed by Amendment 40. Amendment 42 relates to the uh, provisions in Section 20 of the Bill that repeals the section of the 2003 Act, which gives powers to the Tribunal to appoint an named person where the patient does not have a named person. This is a consequential amendment to remove the right to appeal that decision on a mission that was picked up during scrutiny of the Bill. As already noted, Amendment 40 removes the default named uh, person provisions. As colleagues will be aware, the Government did not remove the default named person rule when we introduced the bill. This is because we had some concerns about protections for the most vulnerable service users. I do not think it would be right, right to remove 
the default name person role without bringing in some form of appeal right concerning those without capacity to either nominate a name person or initiate an application or appeal to the tribunal. Without some alternative appeal right, the patient would in effect not be able to appeal where they had no named person. In the case of a short-term detention certificate, they, they could be detained for 28 days with no automatic review or right of appeal, which may be of concern in relation to their ECHR rights. We have therefore introduced a limited right to initiate certain appeals and applications for the patient's guardian, welfare attorney, primary carer or nearest relative. In the absence of a named person, it is our view that these are the best place people to act. They are referred to in the amendments as listed persons. It is important to emphasise that they can only act where the patient themselves does not have the capacity to do so. The amendment would also allow a patient's guardian or welfare attorney to receive certain information or notifications that would otherwise have been given to a named person. In coming to this view, the government has balanced a range of factors. This includes protecting vulnerable service users, but also respecting patient autonomy and privacy. This feels to us about the best solution that meets all these important considerations. If certain provisions of Amendment 43 are designed to address our policy of respecting patient autonomy and privacy. This includes subsection 7, which allows the patient to make a written declaration that they would not want their primary carer or nearest relative to have the ability to make applications and appeals on the patient's behalf at the times when the patient does not have the capacity to do so. A patient may, for example, make such a declaration if they have made a decision that they did not want a named person. Subsection 6 provides protection in relation to privacy by having the effect that a guardian and welfare attorney does not automatically receive a certain uh, potentially sensitive information in the same way that a named person would at the section mentioned. For example, if a responsible medical officer determines that a compulsory treatment order is to be extended, the guardian and welfare attorney will receive notification of that determination, but not the full record setting out the reasons for the determination and any views expressed by the mental health officer. It is important that I also put on record an additional provision to this which is not uh, covered uh, by the Bill. Our intention is that the listed person will only be able to initiate the application or appeal uh, with the agreement uh, of uh, sorry, at the hearing, a uh, curator, uh, curator ad litem would take over. We will also, with the agreement of the tribunal, seek to amend the tribunal rules so that the listed person does not automatically receive copies of papers, orders, records or certificates, as this could contain sensitive information. Uh, we are continuing to work on the best solution to this particular issue, and I will be working uh, closely with the tribunal and commission. I am happy to take views of committee members and stakeholders going forward as the best way to do this. Is this as a vital uh, aspect of uh, the bill, I am determined to get it uh, right. And in that regard, I should refer back to Dr Simpson Reid raised uh, cross-border transfers earlier. And I will be happy to look at anything uh, Dr Simpson would like the government to consider uh, in uh, relation to these uh, matters. Uh, if, uh, for any reason, we do not feel we can achieve uh, this through tribunal rules, then I will look to propose amendments at stage three. I fully understand the concerns around sensitive information being received by carers and relatives who do not want to receive it uh, and around breaching the service users' privacy or policy intention as this will not happen. Turning to the non-government amendments, Amendment 103 relates to how a person does not wish a named person to make such a declaration, in particular it removes the requirement that be done in writing. If the government amendments to remove the default named person are accepted, uh, as uh, Nanette Mullen has uh, noted, this amendment uh, becomes uh, redundant. I would ask her not to press her amendment. Amendment 105 would give the Mental Health Tribunal uh, powers to appoint a person to provide independent advocacy services where the service user has no named person. It would also give ministers powers to make regulations to prescribe the functions of the independent advocate as long as it did not give them access to medical uh, records. The role of an advocate is different from that of a named person convener and it should remain so. Amendment 105, I believe, would blur the lines of, uh, in, in terms of what the role of what an advocate should be to express the wishes of the person they advocate for and not make decisions uh, for them. While I accept the intent is positive, I do not support this amendment. It seems to envisage that the Mental Health Tribunal might appoint a person to provide advocacy services to a patient. However, advocacy services have to be accepted voluntarily, uh, nor are independent advocates a replacement for any person who has the right to initiate proceedings and take part in proceedings independently of the patient. And on that basis, I'd ask Rhoda Grant not to press the amendment. The intention of Amendment 108 is to put a right of appeal for 
uh, name persons against the uh, cross-border transfers in the face of the 2003 Act. I cannot accept the drafting of this amendment as it refers to subsection 2901F of the 2003 Act. That provision does not exist. However, I'm in agreement about the policy intention. I'm happy to put on the record. Uh, I will ensure a, a right of appeal for named persons against uh, cross-border transfers will be covered by regulations on cross-border transfers. Uh, and I, I've already made the commitment to Dr Simpson. I hope this provides the necessary assurance for Nanette Mullen. Again, I ask her not to press uh, the amendment. Thank you, Kimbiela. Um, I call Rhoda Grant to, to speak to Amendment 105 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've listened carefully to what the Minister says, and I very much welcome um, the, the, with the, the removal of the default name person in, in the bill. Um, however, I don't think we're here yet. Um, my amendment was to try and provide some additional support um, for people who maybe don't have capacity um, in the situation where they are um, having to undertake compulsory treatment. Um, and I, I, I've listened to what the Minister said and indeed others and, and will not move that amendment. However, I think there are issues with the Minister's Amendment 43 as well, which I think also seeks um, to provide additional support to people in the situation where they don't have a named person. Um, but I have concerns about that in that it still puts a carer or a relative in that position and doesn't give them the, the opportunity to refuse to take that um, that um, action on behalf of a patient. It also um, gives the next of kin maybe stronger um, uh, rights than the carer, who I think um, it would be important to, to, as the primary person who is dealing um I'm happy to give way. Yes, I think it may be helpful in the process. Then. Yes, okay. th thank you, Convener. Just to clarify where she expressed concerns about uh, Amendment 43 uh, putting requirements on uh, carers and uh, those with power of attorney, it should be clear that no such requirement is placed upon them. It gives them the right to initiate proceedings. They do not have to do so. That, that is really helpful. Um, but the Minister will be aware that Sam H still have concerns about that amendment um, and it, certainly with the ranking between primary carer and next of kin and concerns of people about next of kin who may have, um, the patient may have issues with being given rights over that patient. What I would suggest is that we have further discussions on that and certainly welcome the Minister's discussions on this previously um, before today. Um, just to make sure we get it right because I think it's a really crucial part of the bill. Um, and I, while welcoming the steps that have been taken, I think we've got a bit further to go before we satisfy everyone on this. Richard Simpson. Yes. Um, can I first of all welcome the, the new amendments by the government? I think that they do, they do help. But they don't actually remove the matter raised by Nanette Milne uh, because the thing about producing writing or in any other means relates to, uh, if I understand the government's uh, suggestion that this 103 should not be pursued, is because this relates to capacity. My problem remains, as it does with the Act, that what constitutes capacity? Now, in terms of the amendment as proposed, incapable has the same meaning as in Section 250 of the Act. Uh, this, I take it, is SIDMA, that is a seriously impaired mental defect, a, mental, a serious impairment of a decision-making ability and not the total loss of capacity as under the, um, as under the uh, 2000 Act, which would be uh, a purpose of being incapable, means incapable of acting, making decisions, communicating decisions, understanding decisions, or retaining the memory of decisions. Now, it is at the nub of some of the discussions that is, are taking place in Civic Scotland, both in health professionals and amongst patient voices, as to the differentiation between SIDMA and the Capacity Act. So I would ask the Minister, in summing up, whether he is actually, in referring to Section 250, he can confirm that this is indeed uh, said... Oh, he was not going to sum up. He's not... Whether he... Did not give way I would be very happy to give way if the convener would allow. Yes, uh, we might be breaking new territory here, or we need to get all this, but I'm sure it's helpful for the debate. We all it would want be to indeed right. very helpful. Minister. Thank you. Just to clarify, I think the concerns that have been raised by 
uh, Nanette Milne, which Dr Simpson seems to be echoing, uh, are no longer uh, a consideration because we're seeking to delete that entire section, so it's no longer a requirement that someone would have to apply in writing in the first place. So it's just to clarify that point. But uh, No one would have to apply at all, is the point? No one would have to... Section. I'll extend right. the, to your conversation. No, no, okay, that's fine. Anyway, I think the minister's made his point, and you'll need to weigh that in consideration. Okay. Uh, okay. If I can continue, then. Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, the, the, um, yes, the question of the um, medical officer's report. Um, that I, I've got some slight concerns about this. In the situation where it may be that the. Uh, this is passing the, the, the responsible medical officer's report to the other persons listed, um, and this not this being something that they may or may not do, depending on how they how they what they see as being whether it's sensitive information or not. Um, I have a slight concern here in that if the advance statement by the patient already indicates that in circumstances where this occurs, that statement should be given, then at the moment it remains the responsibility of the responsible medical officer to decide and not, in fact, uh, the patient's decision when given in, in full capacity within an advanced statement. So I have some slight concern about that. Now, I realise the minister can't come back because he's not summing up, but it may be that uh, we would need to look at that in stage three. And the last element is advocacy. Um, um, Rhoda Grant's amendment is to try and add advocacy on I understand fully, that, and it, we'll come to this later when discussing advocacy, that advocacy, uh, advocates should normally be notified and informed, but they don't actually represent patients or make appeals on behalf of patients. And I fully accept the Minister's view that that distinction needs to be maintained. However, in the absence of either a guardian, a welfare attorney, a primary carer, or a near relative, then there remains individuals who where there is no named individual, are not going to have anyone actually operating on their behalf. And in those circumstances, I, I believe that it, the, the, the um, Alliance for Advocacy, the Independent Advocacy Alliance, uh, would, would be prepared to actually allow advocates to be nominated to be able to carry out these actions. So Rhoda Grant's amendment may have some merit. So if these amendments 103 and 105 may not be being pressed, but, but I do believe that they do require to be addressed before we get to stage three. Is it, I mean, I'm going off script here, I suppose, and Nanette Millen uh, has got the right to wind up and press on the throne. I'm going to come to her in a moment, but there was a, there was a lot of discussion there, and I think there's a, a will. I don't know whether the minister wants to respond to any of that. Just very briefly, obviously, I've intervened a couple of times to try and clarify, and hopefully that's been helpful. Let me clarify one other point. Richard Simpson, Dr Simpson, seemed to be concerned that the report of a mental health officer could be passed on uh, to those identified as listed persons. I should emphasise the point I made uh, in my uh, opening remarks. That's not quite the case. The determination of the mental health officer will pass on the content of the report would not be, so I hope that takes care of some of his concerns. I, I, think, I accept the point that uh, Dr Simpson's made uh, laterally in terms of uh, further safeguards for uh, those without past act who may not have anyone else to act on their behalf. Uh, Ms Grant's asked for a further discussion, so let me commit to that further dialogue with, with her on that matter. Thanks, Minister. I now move to uh, Nanette Millen. Uh, to wind up uh, press, uh, press a withdrawal. Yes, I, I'm happy to accept the, the Minister's explanation as to why my motion is, is no longer necessary and I uh, won't be pressing it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the members agree to withdraw the amendment? Okay. okay. I now move then to call amendment 39. Uh, in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 103. Minister, to move forward. Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I now call Amendment 40 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 103. Minister, to move formally. Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, now call Amendment 41 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 103. Minister, to move formally. It moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Thanks. Question is uh, then that section 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. I now call Amendment 42 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 103. Minister, to move formally. Moved, convener. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, the question then is that Section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 43 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 103. Minister, to move formally. Moved, convener. Um, the question then is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, now call Amendment 105 in the name of Rhoda Grant. Already debated with Amendment 103. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Uh, I therefore call uh, Amendment 104 uh, in the name of Rhoda Grant in a group on its own. Rhoda Grant to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you, Convener. Um, this amendment is to um, reflect the rights of carers and gives um, gives um, the powers to draw up a code of practice um, on the guidance of the role of carers and relatives, um, but being very clear that the, that doesn't give them access to medical records. So it does provide some balance um, against the next of kin not being involved, but it allows, parent, uh, allows carers and relatives to have an input to a patient's treatment. And I think this is most important when it comes to discharge planning. A lot of people have told me when a, a patient is being discharged from hospital, the carers um, very seldom have any information. And uh, in, in some cases, carers have told me that this has led to them being unprepared and indeed unable to support. And uh, given that this is a time of a big suicide risk, it's really important that carers are involved in that planning so that they can support and indeed decide whether or not they are able to support that person through that process. And I think that's really important. So it gives powers um, to create the code of practice so that, that those things can be put in place. And given the powers to create a code of practice, I think, uh, understands that the role of carers may change and move on um, and therefore can be adapted rather than being put on the face of the bill. Thank you. Any other, uh, other members? Yes, Bob uh, Doris. Thanks, Commissioner. Just very, very briefly, um, I'm inspired to kind of speak on this. Uh, just listening to, to to Ms. Grant's comments, uh, um, this committee uh, held a uh, an event yesterday, uh, speaking to, to to a variety of, of carers in, in Glasgow. And one of the issues that was raised there, not in relation to mental health issues, I have to say, was uh, carers not being routinely informed when there are such things as discharges discharging from hospital and the like. So it's merely to put on the record for us we're debating this. This might not be a specific issue to uh, mental health provision, but more in connection to, to, to carers' rights more more, more generally and, and communication to them. So I mean, I'm open-minded whether this is the right place to address this or, or elsewhere, convener, but I think uh, it's just important to put on the record that I don't think this is specific to uh, mental health issues. Any other members? No other members. Minister? Uh, Convener, in picking up Mr Doris's point, of course, this the government takes the role of carers very seriously and the responsibility to better support carers very seriously. And that's, of course, why we've lodged the Carers Bill, which I know this committee is beginning to uh, consider. Uh, involving carers and relatives in a patient's care and treatment is uh, important. It's one of the strong themes that emerged from the consultation on the mental health strategy. And it was one that was raised with me in correspondence. I welcome the fact that Rudy Grant's amendment has allowed us to get this issue on the record, the best care and treatment needs professionals to work with carers and patients collaboratively where all are able to contribute. Uh, making that work can be difficult and requires good professional judgment and skill about sharing information and involving carers while taking account of the patient's views, which are sometimes in conflict. I recognise that Rhoda's Grant's uh, amendment is intended to reflect exactly that point, the concern that patients might have about carers having access to information that they would not once shared by emphasising that patient records cannot be shared. Indeed, other legislation already provides safeguards on the confidentiality of medical uh, records. In developing the revised code of practice, I intend to include guidance about the involvement of carers and relatives, and I will ask the working group that is developing the revised code to do that and to, ref to reflect the good practice that exists. And my view is that this does not need to be something that is included on the face of the bill, but I would want to make my commitment 
on the record that it should be covered in the revised code of practice and I would be happy to discuss how we could do this with Rhoda Grant and uh, if it is the case that she wants to pursue an amendment uh, at stage three in light of that discussion I'd be happy to work with her to try and bring forward a, a revised amendment at that stage that reflects how the code of practice supports good practice in involving carers and relatives and on that basis would urge a Rhoda Grant not to press her amendment at stage two. Rhoda Grant, wind up, press withdraw. I, I welcome the, the Minister's commitment to ensure that this is covered in the revised code of practice um, and because of that I will withdraw at this stage and maybe come back at stage three if that's required. Uh, committee members content with the withdrawal? Yeah. Thank you. We now move to call Amendment 82 in the name of Richard Simpson, grouped with Amendments 83 and 84. Dr Simpson, uh, to move Amendment 82 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, during the course of the evidence sessions, it became clear there was a strong desire amongst those engaged in the mental health field to strengthen the role of independent advocacy and the series of amendments which I've tabled do just that. The first intention is to ensure that in all situations where the patient or the patient's named person, carer or other representative, such as a legal representative, are to be informed or notified, the independent advocate, if such a person is in place providing a service to the patient, should also be notified. The other two roles which the advocate may take on, where it is not simply a matter of notifying, uh, notification or informing, uh, is uh, where uh, is in respect of making representations or making an application on behalf of a patient. As I mentioned in discussion of an earlier amendment, these are not usual roles for an advocate. But in the absence of other being willing to undertake this role, it seems to me appropriate that advocates should actually be at least asked if they would make the representations or applications or they would wish to do so based on their knowledge of the patient. So these... Um, um, these additional duties I recognise do go, go beyond the more usual role of an advocate. Um, the other amendment, which is supported more widely by the Scottish uh, Independent Advocacy Alliance, Sam H, and others, is to ensure that there is adequate monitoring of the availability and accessibility of advocacy service, services. Um, there is considerable evidence that despite the welcome advance in the deployment and availability and use of independent advocates, the picture is anything but uniform. And I believe we need to be aware of the situation and the monitoring and reporting which I have suggested in this amendment, which, which as being best undertaken by the Mental Welfare Commission, would help. There should be regular reports from the local authorities and NHS boards which would allow the Commission to determine the adequacy of independent advocacy services and report to the Scottish Ministers on this. I would expect thereafter that Scottish Ministers would wish to report from time to time to the Parliament or to the Health and Sport Committee on this issue. It is certainly one which has been concerning the Committee over a number of years. Uh, I wish to move the amendments in my name. Um, any other members wish to speak on that? No, Minister. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Some of my remarks will be similar to those uh, related to Rhoda Grant's uh, amendment in the Group uh, 11 debate. As drafted, Richard Simpson's amendments 82 and 83 uh, make provision for rights for advocates that are extensive and go uh, beyond the role that advocates normally play to assist the patient to access the rights rather than having rights to make representations, access to information uh, and to lead and produce evidence at the tribunal. I do, however, See that the amendments uh, may have been developed to fill a gap which is created by removing the default position of having a named person where a person is not appointed a named person and where the person is not able to act on their own behalf. The Scottish Government Amendment 43, which the committee has just agreed, is intended to provide for that situation by including a limited list of people who can act in limited circumstances on behalf of a patient who does not have a named person who is not able to act on their own behalf and, of course, just committed to having some dialogue with Ms Grant and I'm also happy to speak to Dr Simpson about uh, this matter in advance of stage three and on that basis I would urge members not to support these uh, two amendments, 82 and 83. I recognise that ensuring that people are able to access advocacy is something that uh, is important to many people and organisations uh, uh, who offered their views during the committee's consideration of the bill this far. Indeed I met with the uh, Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance to discuss some of these matters a couple of weeks ago. I understand too that 
Some people have interpreted the fact that we did not include anything in the bill specifically about advocacy as an indication that is not important. That is definitely not the case. Convener, my view is that the 2003 Act already sets out duties to provide advocacy. I accept that people's experience of accessing advocacy does not always meet their expectations. It is important that we understand that and ensure that people are able to access services and their rights. The Mental Welfare Commission has indicated that it could be possible to develop reporting that is not overly resource intensive. If that proves to be the case for NHS boards and local authorities as well as the Commission, I would be prepared to work with uh, Dr Simpson to bring forward an amendment at stage three. Uh, I would urge Dr Simpson not to press his amendment uh, 84 on that basis. Uh, Dr Simpson, wind up press withdraw. Yes. The, the issue, as the Minister has quite rightly said, is that with there being the possibility of no named person, uh, that uh, individuals may in fact be unrepresented. And I believe that uh, the advocacy role could be extended reasonably in these rather limited circumstances. The situation again is complicated for me by the difference between the Adults with Incapacity Act measurement of capacity and the Mental Health Bill's measurement of capacity. This is a, a fundamental problem to which we will return in later amendments. Um, but where the capacity is very seriously impaired, individual patients may be left uh, totally unrepresented. And in those circumstances, it seems to me reasonable that the advocate, if they have previous knowledge of the patient, and they may well do so, um, should be able to make an application or make representation on their behalf on the basis of previous understanding. Um, I will accept the Minister's view at the present time and not move these amendments on the basis that we can have some further discussions and look at whether the role of the advocate needs to be enhanced within the Act or within regulations in order to ensure that patients do not go unrepresented. Amen Amendment uh, 82 has been withdrawn. No, no member objects? No. Um, can I then um, call Amendment 83 in the name of Richard Simpson? Already debated with Amendment 82. Dr Richard Simpson, move or not move? Not move. Not move. Um, we then move to call Amendment 84 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 82. Um, Dr Richard Simpson, uh, to move or not move? Not move. Not move. Um, the, therefore, I call Amendment 44 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 45, 46, 106 and 107. And I uh, um, take the opportunity to point out at this time, if Amendment 46 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 106 or 107, as they would be preempted. Minister to move Amendment 44 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Uh, convener, the Government's intention with Section 21 was to increase the uptake of advance statements. We had hoped that a central register of statements could do that by giving reassurance that the statement could always be located through the central register. However, we have listened to stakeholder concerns that this could have an adverse effect and deter some service users from making an advance statement. I had also hoped that such a system would lead to advance statements being more readily available for relevant practitioners when they required them. It is now clear that this might not be the case. We have therefore worked with the Mental Welfare Commission to develop alternative proposals that will not require the statement to be sent, but will require certain information to be sent to the Commission to help them monitor the numbers of advance statements made and to provide a central place where the existence and location of an advance statement is recorded, but the advance statement itself is not held. Uh, Amendment 44, it removes the provision that required the Health Board to send a copy of the statement to the Commission. It sets out the information that should be sent instead, which includes that a statement or withdrawal document exists, where it is held, and any personal and administrative details essential for identifying the record as the person's uh, 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 advance uh, statement. Uh, Amendment 45 will ensure that there is a central register of information about advance statements kept by the Commission. This will provide a source of information if there is any uncertainty as to whether a statement exists for a particular patient or where it is held by requiring the Commission to mark the date of entry, thus ensure there is no confusion when a subsequent statement is made or if a statement is withdrawn. Amendment 46 is a consequential amendment to Amendments 44 and 45. 
It removes the reference to anything kept in the register to be inspected at a reasonable time by the a person to whom the thing relates and replaces it with a reference to an entry in the register to be inspected at a reasonable time by the person whose medical records are referred to in the entry to reflect the changes to the information kept in the register. It therefore takes care of the concerns about the legislative terminology that I believe Nanette Milne's amendments 106 and 107 we need it addressing. Beyond this, there is a problem with amendments 106 and 107, as we make the provisions refer to an advance statement only, and not also to a document withdrawing one. If both things need to be covered, with no thing remaining in the text, and with the omission to a reference to any withdrawal document, uh, I would uh, ask Nanette Milne uh, respectfully not to press her amendments, and uh, I move Amendment 44. Thank you. Minister Nanette Millen to speak to amendments 106 and 107 and other amendments in the group. Yes, well, I mean, as, as has been said, the, my amendments are largely technical, altering the language in, in section 21, which, which amends section 276C of the 2003 Act. Um, so the Commission will keep a register of advanced statements. And while the words inserted by the bill as it stands would allow anything in the register to be inspected, the context is clear that this can only refer to advanced statements. So the amendment I'm proposing will alter the language in Section 21 to provide additional clarity, replacing thing and anything with advanced statement. And I do say the, 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 the terminology the Minister has, has indicated is not exactly the same as that, but I think it, it covers the same meaning. Any other members? No. Minister? Not Nothing to add. Um, the question is then that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, call Amendment 45 in the name of the Minister. I've already debated with Amendment 44. Minister, to move formally? Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 46 in the name of the Minister, already debated um, uh, with Amendment 44. I remind members that if Amendment 46 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 106 or 107. Um, Minister, to move formally. Thank you. The, the question is then that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Uh, I now call Amendment um, 85, in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, grouped with amendments 86 and 87. Um, Dr Simpson, to move amendment 85 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, first of all, can I welcome the changes that the Minister has made to the registration process? That, uh, I think that that was something which was raised uh, in the evidence which we received about protecting confidentiality and privacy, found <coughs> statements. Um, but I've drafted a number of amendments seeking to ensure that the privacy and confidentiality was fully protected um, and that the registration with the Commission, I think, goes a large way to that. However, the statement itself will now be held elsewhere and my additional amendment will, um, um, to write in Section 276D, a requirement upon the Ministers by regulation to set up the circumstances under which a person or persons may have access to advanced statements and I believe this does uh, remain pertinent, though I would be happy to hear from the Minister as to whether that is or is not the case. The other amendment, ah, no, that's it, 85, 86. Uh, the other amendment in this group is 87, uh, which is about promotion in, uh, of um, uh, promotion of advanced statements in the name of Bob Doris, and I would be very supportive of this amendment. Thank you. Bob Doris, you speak to Amendment 87 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. And, and speaking uh, to Amendment 87 in my name, can I thank Sam H for their, their partnership work to bring this amendment forward at, at Stage 2. This amendment, if passed, would place a duty on health boards and local authorities to promote advanced statements. This amendment also has the support of a wide range of variety of stakeholders, um, I should say. Advanced statements are a powerful tool which allow people with mental health problems to state what treatment they do or do not wish to receive in the event that they are treated compulsorily under the Act. Whilst these statements are not binding, medical staff must notify the person, the person's name person and the Mental Welfare Commission in writing if the statement is overridden, setting out that reason. Uh, no information is currently available at present on the number of advanced statements that have been made, but the Mental Welfare Commission was notified of 31 overrides in the year 2013-14. Of course, with other provisions passed in this Act, we will start to get some robust data in, in relation to that matter. Sam H. Research suggests there is a very mixed awareness of the right to make an advanced statement that people do not often feel they are well promoted. 
and that whilst there is strong support for the concept, people are sceptical about whether they will be taken seriously or not. A duty to promote advanced statements coupled with stronger guidance in the Code of Practice about when and how this should take place has the potential to increase uptake and empower people to be clear about what they did and did not want to happen. Uh, our committee noted in our Stage 1 report the government's uh, preference to raise awareness of advanced statements from the, the, the grassroots, I believe, was the expression raised, but we did ask the government to consider placing a, a duty to promote within the bill, and that's what this amendment does. If the government uh, cannot support placing a duty on the, the face of the bill, I would, I would need some additional assurances about how the, 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 the four points raised on the face of the bill that that have worked in partnership with SAMH and ensure to make sure that uh, advanced statements are indeed promoted can be achieved by another means. Any other members? No. Minister? Thank you, Convener. I thank Dr Simpson for setting out his thinking on Amendment 85. I remain unclear, however, what is about what is envisaged might be set out in the proposed regulations beyond the requirement for access to an advanced statement to relate to the exercise of functions under this Act. The Act already, for example, requires the designated medical practitioner to have regard to an advanced statement before making a decision under sections 2362C, 2391C or 2411C of the Act. I am also mindful of the fact that when an advanced statement is lodged in a patient's medical records, it should be treated as a medical record in terms of patient confidentiality and we should also ensure that service users have as much control over who accesses their advanced statement without there being too much bureaucracy governing how they share their information. I'm not convinced of the need for this amendment and therefore invite Dr Simpson not to press Amendment 85 and its consequential Amendment 86. In terms of Amendment 87, I am conscious that the committee recommended in its Stage 1 report that the Scottish Government consider placing a statutory duty on health boards and local authorities to promote advanced statements. As I said during the Stage 1 debate, I very much agree with the committee's belief that more can be done to promote advanced statements and I was very happy to recently meet with Sam H who were mentioned by Mr Doris and this was uh, a matter that has been uh, the subject of discussion between themselves and myself. But I want to ensure that, the, uh, that promoting advanced statements is done in the most meaningful way and a way that has the most impact and uh, remain unconvinced that using legislation would uh, necessarily in of itself achieve that. I think there are other effective ways for service users to be supported and encouraged to make an advanced statement uh, exist, including peer support initiatives. Given this and the burden that such a duty might place in health boards and local authorities, I, I might invite Mr Dawson not to press uh, this amendment. I would be happy, of course, to meet with him to discuss uh, the uh, work he's undertaken with Sam H thus far and uh, have a, a discussion with him about these matters. But in uh, requesting uh, Mr Dawson not, press, uh, not pressing his amendment, I would make it clear that the Scottish Government will look to do more to promote advanced statements as part of implementation of the bill and we will of course be happy uh, to have the input of the committee as part of that work. Thank the Minister. Richard Simpson to wind up um, pressure withdrawal. Yes, um, I'm not totally convinced that the amendments 45, 40, 44, 45, 46 to which we've already agreed actually covers the situation adequately and I still think that there need to be regulations beyond the current bill's provision for the medical responsible medical officer to have regard to the divine statement and therefore to have access to it. There, there should be some regulations which are allow or do not allow other persons to have access uh, and therefore I and these amendments may not be perfect and the government may wish to amend them further at the next stage, but if they were passed, I think they would make a statement about the need for ensuring that there is clarity in the regulations about who should or should not access these advanced statements. I also feel that on Amendment 87 that, um, that it, it, needs, it needs to be supported. Of course, it could be further amended at, at uh, Stage 3 by the government if they felt that this was necessary, um, but um, I do feel that it should be pressed. Okay, the question is then that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, no. Uh, the members are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour of the amendment? Those against? Thanks. No abstentions. Uh, for the Amendment 4, against the Amendment 5, the amend amendment is therefore not agreed. 
We now uh, call Amendment 86 in the name of Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 85. Richard Simpson, to move or not move? Moved. Move. Uh, the question is then that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Um, the committee members are not agreed, so there, there will be a division. Those, all those in favour of the amendment? Those against? Thank you. No abstentions. Uh, for the Amendment 4, against the Amendment 5, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. Um, the question now is that uh, Amendment 86 be agreed to. No, 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 where am I? I'm um, going to Simpson the way Amendment 85. Yeah, no, that's. Um, we go to Bob Doris's. Yeah. Uh, can I call Amendment 87 in the name of Bob Doris? Already debated with Amendment 85. Bob Doris, to move or not move? Uh, convener, um, the Minister has asked me to uh, not press this amendment um, and he's raised the, the issue of the burden that this may place on health boards and local authorities. I have to say I'm unconvinced to the extent of the burden that would be placed on health boards and local authorities given looking at the the provisions within the bill. I can't imagine, for example, why health boards and local authorities wouldn't want to promote the existence, effectiveness, status of the provisions in the Act about advanced statements, irrespective of whether there was a duty to promote on the face of the bill. But that said, um, I'd be happy to meet with the Minister to discuss uh, what that burden may or may not be. Or indeed, I'm also conscious that by putting something on the face of the bill doesn't necessarily mean there will be a quality and extensive promotion of advanced statements. I'd be intent on holding my position to stage three with the possibility of bringing back a revised amendment depending on the outcome of any meetings with the Minister. I know Richard Simpson uh, is keen for me to press this amendment and of course if he wishes to do so that would be the prerogative of Mr Simpson to do that but on the basis that the Minister has agreed to meet with me to look at this matter uh, further uh, I will not press this, this amendment. Okay, you're not moving. The question is then that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Uh, the, the question is, I'm looking to Richard here, but I'm, 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 as I said earlier, I'm not calling for you to do that. I, I pointed out earlier um, that... Am I permitted to move this amendment? Yes. Thank you. I would like to move this amendment. Yeah, I'm moving Amendment 87. Um, the question is then that Amendment 87 uh, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There is a division. Um, uh, the committee are not agreed. Uh, all those in favour of the amendment, please show. All those against? Uh, for the amendment four, against the amendment five, the amendment is therefore not agreed. The question now is that um, section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. Uh, call Amendment 88 in the name of Richard Simpson and the group on its own, Dr Richard Simpson, to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the, the committee will probably realise that I've been wrestling throughout this bill with the differentiation between the definition of incapacity in the Adults with Incapacity Bill and the lower test of capacity, commonly known as SIDMA. Uh, the conclusion reached when we debated this in 2003 was that it was appropriate uh, whilst modernising the 1983 Mental Health Act, that the SIDMA test should be applied and not the, the incapacity test in the 2000 Act. However, uh, as the significant impairment of decision-making ability is a lesser test uh, required with adults than the Incapacity Act, and whilst in the overwhelming majority of cases this serves the interests of the patient well, I believe that there are circumstances in which the patient's rights under the Human Rights Convention to refuse medical treatment is being denied inappropriately. And this amendment, as drafted, seeks in a very modest way to ensure that where the patient makes an advanced statement, which they make, of course, whilst they have full capacity, that their wishes should be followed, then they should be followed unless the capacity is so impaired as to meet the more stringent requirements of test of incapacity in the 2000 Incapacity Act. I believe that we must recognise that the under-usage of advanced statements may in part be because there is a feeling, realistic or not, that the wishes expressed in such advanced statements will not be fully respected. And this is despite the fact that there is already a requirement that where 
uh, that where and at what time of treatment has to be given on the orders of the tribunal, such variation must be reported to the Mental Welfare Commission if it doesn't reflect the advanced statement. This proposed amendment is a rather modest proposal um, uh, and pens a much fuller review of the acts, which I believe now to be necessary, uh, governing the whole issue of mental health and capacity, including, of course, the protection of vulnerable adults. But uh, since publishing my amendments, I've received some questions as to whether this actually does exactly what I intended, uh, so it may need to be modified at stage three, but I do believe that it should be passed at this point and then modified uh, unless the Minister agrees in principle that this amendment is appropriate and is then willing to discuss its inclusion in a modified form in stage three. Any other members wish to participate in the debate? No other members. Um, Minister? Thank you, Convener. I uh, share the Mental Welfare Commission's concerns about the intended effect of subsection 3B and what the proposal would mean for urgent cases. Tribunal hearings can take some time to arrange, and during this time the amendment would mean that the patient could not be given treatment. This treatment could be essential for their immediate well-being and their long-term recovery and rehabilitation. I'm also not sure of the need for this amendment. Advanced statements are written statements setting out how patients would wish to be treated or wish not to be treated for mental disorder should their ability to make decisions about treatment for their mental disorder become significantly impaired as a result of their mental disorder. However, this amendment seems to relate to situations where the patient is capable of consenting to treatment. In such situations where a patient is judged as capable in terms of the 2003 Act, we would expect the patient's consent to the treatment to be the primary consideration. In addition, from what I understand, there is not a significant issue that needs to be addressed. There are a relatively small number of instances when advanced statements are overridden each year. The current framework does ensure that doctors and tribunals take account of advanced statements and require them to set out reasons why they are overridden whenever that is the case. Uh, on that basis, I would uh, invite Dr Simpson not to press this amendment. Dr Simpson, to wind up, press or withdraw. There remains a fundamental point, and that is the right of any individual to refuse treatment if they, if they have the capacity to do so. And my proposal is that, the, that SIDMA is not a total loss of capacity. And therefore, in those circumstances, if the patient chooses to refuse treatment, they should be entitled to do so. They are not entitled under the Act as it stands. Uh, and therefore, this would apply the more severe test of the Incapacity Act, where total there was a complete loss of capacity, and that would, uh, that would allow treatment to, to, to proceed. I do not believe uh, that, that moving forward from the original Act, which I very much supported at the time, that we have got this balance right. And I think that this very modest situation, which allows the advanced statement given at a time of full capacity to be fully respected unless the patient has lost capacity reflected in the 2000 Act and not the 2003 Act. I will wish to press my amendment. Okay. The question is then that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Committee has not agreed. No, oh, sorry, 80. Yeah. No. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There isn't a, a committee are not agreed. There will be a decision. Those in favour of the amendment, please show. Those against? For the Amendment 4, against the Amendment 5, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. I uh, now call Amendment 47 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendments 48 and 49. Minister, to move Amendment 47 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 47 seeks to amend an incorrect cross-reference which was inadvertently left in the version of the Bill introduced to Parliament. A prior version of this Bill went out to consultation and draft. The consultation version of the Bill contained a provision which would have inserted a new section 57A into the 2003 Act. This related to a previous proposal related to the applications for compulsory treatment orders. However, this provision was removed following comments coming out of a consideration of the consultation responses. The reference to section 57A2, which appears in new inserted section 261A4, is therefore being removed. Amendment 48 inserts a new section 291A into the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003, the 2003 Act. This will provide 
that there must be no conflict of interest in relation to certain medical examinations carried out for the purpose of a variety of sections under the 2003 Act. The amendment also has the effect of extending the coverage of existing conflict of interest provisions in the 2003 Act to also include compulsion order and compulsion order restriction order reviews. In addition, the new section confers a power upon Scottish ministers to make regulations which may specify circumstances in which there is taken or not taken to be a conflict of interest. The amendment has been proposed following concerns from stakeholders that conflict rules apply in relation to the making of a compulsory treatment order, for example, but not in relation to its extension. Stakeholders have also identified that similar provisions do not also apply in relation to reviews of compulsion orders. There is a strong feeling that conflict rules should apply and where a conflict exists, the responsible medical officer should be required to arrange for the examination to be carried out by an approved medical practitioner. This is something that can be considered under the proposed regulations. Amendment 49 amends section 245 of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. It adds to the list of people who must be consulted in circumstances where certain certificates are granted in accordance with the 2003 Act. It will provide additional protections for patients in light of the removal of the default named person that has already been discussed and agreed under Amendment 40. I therefore move Amendment 47. Thank you, Minister. Any members wish to speak in this debate? Minister, no further... Uh, uh, the question is then that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. question uh, therefore follows that um, Section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, that ends today's Day 1 of Stage 2 consideration of amendments uh, to the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Um, day 2 will take place at the committee meeting next Tuesday uh, and we'll start at the point which we have ended today. A further marshal list uh, and groupings will be issued on Wednesday. Uh, we now move to uh, agenda item number three, which has uh, pre you know we previously agreed will be held in private session. Thank you all for your cooperation and patience today.